Welcome to the Non Sequitur Show. Continual watching beyond this point may result in terminal face palming and a complete loss of wokeness. You have been warned. Okay, welcome. Welcome, everybody. So we have a really interesting uh, show for you tonight. This is a part three of a series that I've done on 10 reasons why I think Christianity is false, at least the classical version of theism. So I got a little panel together uh, to have a discussion with one of the more infamous preceptors out there, uh, somebody who's been doing this for a very long time, Satyam Prunikit. But before I invite, before I like, get to him, I want to like uh, get to uh, do the panel first so I can... Uh, talk to him a little bit uh, about precept before we go dive into this so you guys know what's going to go on here uh but first let me introduce uh christopher green he's been on the show before christopher green uh we got david pullman who's a christian apologist we got floyd fp who's a, a atheist apologist i guess so. <laughs> sure, sure. <laughs> and we got uh, ben speed Watkins from real in the who is one of my favorite philosophy people thank you for having me on and so we have the, the, the Saitan Brinnikid, who's been on many times before, and it's always entertaining. So I want to welcome you back, because I know you've been, you know, out of it for a while, and, you know, this is probably one of your first forays back into the scene. So I appreciate you coming on the non sequitur show to, to uh, talk about these particular topics. Um, how you been, first of all? I've been, uh, I've been hanging in. <laughs> yeah, it's been an interesting ride. I've done a couple of uh, Christian podcasts uh, since my uh, return, but this is the first with an atheist. Oh, sorry, you're not an atheist. Yeah, <laughs> see, at least he gets no, but... it. Somebody understands. <laughs> but one thing I do it. want to say, though, is in my um, uh, hiatus, uh, whatever you want to call it, um, you were one of the kindest people to me. I mean, um, I, I, I was actually um, shocked by how I was treated by some in the Christian community, and um, I think there were some people that actually actively wanted me to feel a uh, fail or delighted in it, but uh, you were actually uh, really good about it. And I would come on your show anyways, but um, I do appreciate it. I think you might have sent you messages as well with the whole uh, non sequitur show stuff. And, um, you know, I just, I do consider you a friend. I know that there's a lot of people out there that hate and can't stand me. I think I've mellowed out over the years, but um, I do appreciate your contact, even when I wasn't coming on these shows. And I'm just happy that you invited me to be here today. I appreciate that, man, really much. I, I really do. I mean, it's, 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 I do have empathy for people, and I think a lot of people don't recognize that. Um, they, they don't know what people are like behind the scenes. They only see people, you know, on air like this, but they don't recognize that we are people with real lives and we have, you know, real feelings. Um, yeah, well, we were talking about this a little bit before we went live, is that most of the stuff of me that's online, you know, wasn't filmed by me for one, but it's, you know, the heated uh, part, because it's very serious stuff that we're talking about. But they don't, uh, you know, they don't show the hour that I talk with a person afterwards and they don't give me a hug. They, they show the, you know, the heated few minutes and, and that's what gets clicks. But that's not really what, what I'm like. I, don't I agree. In fact, some of the best conversations we've had were been on non sequitur and they've always been amicable. Uh, they've always been friendly. They've always been interesting. You know, we, we clearly don't agree on a lot of things. I mean, straight up, we just don't agree. <laughs> But that doesn't really matter much to me. I, I, I appreciate the fact that, one, you actually hold the positions you hold, and two, you're willing to actually have conversations with them. That's that's what I'm, what I'm looking for, honest dialogue. You don't have to believe like I do. You don't have to um, say the, the, you know, uh, the, the exact same things I, I say, but that's fine. It's, it, that's why we have these types of programs where we can get differing positions. I can't stand people like Flat Earth who's come on who don't actually think the Earth is flat, who just propose. Uh, that, to me, just it's just mind-blowing. Right. That's one of the reasons I, I don't have no interest in talking to Tom Jump is that he, he, uh, he doesn't argue his position. And he's very unkind to people who, you know, make a good point for one, but people who disagree with him. I mean, just ends up name calling. And Tom, I just Tom have no could be a little bit belligerent. And, and Tom really, his positions are interesting because 
they're so unique because they're so off the off the wall. I mean, his whole moral theory is just bonkers. You know? Yeah, I, I know. Very, very strange. I just saw a podcast with him just uh, recently, and I just thought it was bizarre on uh, on Gigi's channel. By oh, the way, yeah. I, I like. I, I saw her. You know, the thing that I like about her is that she, when she believes that a Christian wins an argument or an atheist, she'll put that out there. Even her interaction with Tom, I tell you, she scares me a little bit. Yeah. I like no, her. Gigi should scare you. Gigi is formidable. That, and that uh, thing uh, when she was talking to Tom Jump and they got into Platonism and, and she was googling at the same time and found out she was right. Man, that scared me. Yeah, she <laughs> she's actually she's really getting uh, to be very knowledgeable in philosophy. She's been uh, in the in the scene for a very long time and. She, as a non-believer, holds the same position I do. We're going to hold non-believers a little bit to stronger accounting because when they put out misinformation, it, it reflects to all of us, right? And Real and Thought Atheology, is, he's been my co-host for like Real uh, Atheology A-Holes, and we both, I think, philosophically agree, we don't like, as non-believers, having atheists say stupid shit. Mm -hmm. We don't like it. We we just don't like it. Theists, we're, we're kind of used to it. No offense, mm -hmm. <laughs> but but we can at least <laughs> talk about that. But as non-believers, I, when atheists make fundamental errors that are not even just like subjective, they're objectively wrong. I think it affects us all. But yeah, you know, I would be happy to never do this again in my life. But then I watch some of these Christians that come on some of these shows. I watched uh, one with uh, Doug, um, you know, on on his podcast, and uh, it was a Christian that was on it, and it was. It was horrendous. Um, so which which Doug are we talking about? I'm sorry, I don't, I don't know um, which one um, You know, um, with the Pine Creek. That, oh, Pine Creek, yeah. Pine, Pine Creek, Creek. Yeah, yes, 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 yes. Yeah. yeah, I was on the show a while ago. Again, had a good conversation with him. I'm, I'm sure that, you know, he would uh, echo your sentiment, Steve. And But then, I mean, he just eviscerates Christian. They look like idiots. Yeah. And I think I would prefer, you know, to just sit back, you know, get a job in oh, a boiler room again. David would be interesting. Dave, Dave, like, Dave is formidable, like I said. Um, even yeah. um, most atheists. We'll take. I, I think that'd be interesting. I, I, I'm sure that he would go for it. You know, he's he's not uh, uh, weak livered. He'll talk to anybody. So. And that and that's what it is. You know, it's so funny because well, we'll get into the topic in a second here. But it it's funny because when I started putting out actual logical arguments for my positions, and I even put a paper out on academic edu, a lot of the atheist community shut the hell up, and they mm -hmm. just they stopped even trying to um, you know argue against my points because I have it there in writing that anybody that knows about logic can go see is correct. And so uh, I got shunned from the atheist community, but they didn't refute me. Yeah, the, the thing that I, I like about you is that you'll actually fairly look at a position, you know, I would say for the most part. But when you see like a Matt Dillahunty video or something that you read through the comments, which I don't do often, but they're just cheerleading sections. Yeah, sometimes the parents, he's the parents too. Like, like there's a video out there that says um, uh, Christian tries to use logic and gets owned. And it's a clip from my debate with Matt Delahunty, I think it's got over a million views, maybe close to 2 million views now. And I watch that clip and I see that as one of the best parts of the debate. Mm -hmm. And then you look to the comment section and every once in a while, there's an atheist who will say, yeah, he didn't get owned there. And not that I care, but you know, that they, they just cheerlead their own view. They don't think uh, critically about what's being said. They just cheerlead. Mm -hmm. yeah, Something right. of yeah. an echo right. chamber. Christian do the thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I, I like, like yeah. that. Yeah, I'm not exactly. I'm no fan of Matt, but Matt did, I thought, did well in that debate. But there was some things that, you know, you do get correct. And that when you do get correct and an atheist argues against you, I'm like, oh my, stop. You guys are barking up the wrong tree here. Give him this one. Give him this one because you're not going to win in the philosophical uh, sphere. So let's kind of dive into this, though. First, I got a, a super chat from my mod, April Van Run. Uh, two dollars Canadian. I'm gonna say stupidish if I want. I'm not sure what that means, but you can do it. Yes, yes, you can do it as a mod. Absolutely. Uh, even if not, you can do that. So yeah, we have a lot of people in the audience. I want to say hi to Snake Was Right, um, Pheasant, Chemo, Maki, Tao, uh, Raisin Girl. Uh, oh, God, I have everybody up there. Okay, so let's dive into this. So, so to say, as you as you know, I had a couple videos. Uh, just some very basic reasons why I think uh, Christianity, at least as a classical theist, is, is, is explaining God is, is false. Um, they're not technical. They're not like grounded in any kind of theological discussions or biblical things. They're very, very kind of basic philosophical reasons because I wanted to, to say, look, if you want to justify atheism, here's a way to do it. Uh, if you want to justify a belief there is no God, here's your do it. Because I hold that theism and atheism are both justifiable positions, okay? Just like a friendly atheist or friendly agnostic would. So... <laughs> I thought I'd bring you on to kind of get a precepor. How do you justify a lack of belief, though? Well, it would be suspended. Oh, no, I'm just messing. I'm yeah. just messing. I had to. I couldn't resist making that joke. <laughs> Hell yeah, Ben. So I do have a bit of a bone to pick with you about this whole thing, Steve, is because um, I haven't really thought that you're a, a clickbaity person, but there is, you know, an aspect of that. You, you need that to get views. But your shows said 
10 reasons why Christianity is false. I, I believe Christianity is false, yeah. At least no, 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 but the thing is, now you say 10 reasons why I think Christianity is Same false. Same thing. That's the, that, the equivalent statement. No, 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 no. So now here's a question. This is a sincere question sure. because I've run this past uh, Christian people as well. But can there be evidence of something that is false? And I'll give you an example. If you did not murder somebody, could there be evidence that you did? Okay, so let's let's dive into that real quick. I haven't, I haven't got started yet. We're already out of the game. No, no, no yeah, just uh, before um, we get going, because sure, this uh, I think uh, is sure. very interesting, because, and I think you're a, you're a critical thinker. If you if in deflation theory of truth, right? If you say something like the snow is white, or you say the snow the snow is white is true, they're the same equivalent statement. I, if I say that I think or I believe, those are called an intentional verb, and for an intentional verb, you have to have an intentional object, which in this case is the propositional content. So if I say I believe. Christianity is false, as far as, like I said, the classical theist version. It's the same thing as the saying theism is false. There's no, there's no difference there, philosophically speaking. Yeah, yeah. I, but okay. Back to my question, though. Um, could there be evidence that uh, that you committed a murder that you didn't commit? Yes. Could there but, be evidence for it, that? It would be weak evidence that wouldn't be veridical, right? Evidence, yeah, I wouldn't call it. I wouldn't even call it weak evidence. I would call it non-evidence well, it's, or it's false. Not, it's not veridical, but fault, there, evidence is evidence which is, which is offered to have explanatory power or to, right. But just so. like you cannot offer any reasons why two plus two does not equal four in base ten mathematics, because it they wouldn't be good reasons, <laughs> right? <laughs> they wouldn't be good right. reasons. So, so, so that's why, and I would say, um, as a presuppositionist, with you, your foundations resting in blind faith, of course, you'll say the same about me. But then you could have no reasons for Christianity to be false, just, you know, reasons why you think it's false. And like I say, I would differ on, um, I would say that you would have to know it's false to have reasons that it's false. Well, or, not, when or else have... not when they're dust-assic. Well, well, yeah, let's, let's, let's get into these, because let's, let's kind of know. ask about them. Um, and then we'll get the panel to kind of weigh in. So, excuse me, hang on. Yeah, the first one. Um, I kind of thought was mostly a, what's called, I called a divine ambivalence. This is the basically that God seems to care a lot back on biblical days. He would walk with people, talk with people. He would send plagues. He would make his presence known. Um, but today, when you have all these atrocities, um, all the things that are happening, natural evils, wars, plague, pestilence, things that we've had for 2,000 years, he doesn't seem to take any interest. Um, so it just seems to be a divine ambivalence, especially toward the non-resistant non-believer, which we'll get into the divine hiddenness thing. But, but, as a presupper, um, if we, if God is not that changing, if God did all these things two thousand years ago, why is, does He seem to have such ambivalence now? And then why, like you answer, and then the panel answer. Yeah, I would argue that it's uh, that there is a progressive revelation, and God in Scripture says exactly how He's going to reveal Himself. Even in Hebrews one, God spoke in a certain way, and He doesn't speak that way anymore. So I wouldn't say that that's an argument for um, Christian being false. I say that that's just how God does stuff. I don't have a problem with it. And, of course, people will have that perception as to God's uh, uh, participation in this world based, as well, on their presuppositions. Because I would say, um, you know, not, of course, in the same way. I would, I would be very reluctant to say I've even seen a miracle. I've had some, maybe two things in my life that I could not explain otherwise than a divine intervention. But, you know, I would even argue that, okay, that perhaps that was not the case. But God has said that he reveals himself, um, you know, there's a progressive revelation in Scripture. And I have no problem, but I, I would say that I see God's hand in my life. Even today, there was something that I could not really explain. It was, you know, and I don't believe in coincidences. So I will see God's hand, and I will see God hand, God's hand in all evidence, in all things. Not, of course, not in the same way as Scripture, but God said he's going to do it a certain way, and I have no problem with that. Because, okay. you know, as a presupposition, I would say even to argue with it uh, against, you know, uh, God's character or what he's doing, you know, of course, you know that I say that you need to borrow that foundation from him yeah and and i i should note that um you know we i think we've all had experiences we can't explain my my things where i could never get those experiences to even be inductive into a god's existence i did it a long time ago when i wasn't this but um ever since then i kind of like had to revisit it and i just can't make that leap from a b c to all the way to, to d on that so floyd do you want to like um weigh in on that well, I mean, we do have a lot of examples in the Bible of, of uh, evidentialism. Uh, I think a classic example is in 1 Kings 18, where you have Elijah <laughs> and the prophets of Baal, you know, having a, a, a fire making contest. And, and, uh, and obviously Elijah wins out on that one. Um, but if something like that happened today, and I, I think that would certainly change my worldview. It would affect a lot of people. I mean, if God revealed himself nowadays, don't you think it would be a very effective means to convert people? 
Yeah, I, I certainly don't want to dominate this conversation, but if you listen to my debate with a, a Christian, he's a follower of William and Craig, he brought up uh, Elijah, First uh, Kings um, 18, and um, he talked about Elijah and the prophets of Baal. And I say, if that was an evidential argument, what did he do once he convinced them that his God was real? He didn't say there's our circumcision tent, line up single file, now that you're part of the community, we're going to circumcise you. He slaughtered them. And the comment that I made in that debate is, you know, that's fine. If William Lane Craig wins an argument with these evidence, that's fine. He's just got to kill his opponent. You know, that that was not an evidential argument for the existence of God. That was judgment for unbelief. So, so, as, so a, you know, as a presupper, though, do you just negate evidentialism as a whole? Because I, I tend to what's called weak evidentialism. I don't go to Well, I, I negate evidentialism. I, I think we all have not, some kind of weak evidentialism we hold to. I negate evidentialism. I think, I think we, maybe we should define evidentialism just yeah, for that's listeners. What you're for, um, <laughs> <laughs> you, you take this, Pat. <laughs> Um, so evidentialism is this idea that uh, we gain knowledge of the world through experience, and so that there are contingent facts about the world that we can then use to infer something like the existence of a religiously significant deity. Um, and this stands in contrast to other traditions in theological circles, um, probably the most prominent in uh, ph philosophical circles today is what's known as Alvin Plantinga's um, properly basic belief reformed or epistemology. Uh, re reformed epistemology, um, where he says that no, ev evidentialism um, is not self-referentially self ju justifying. It can't justify itself. And so that we are going to need something more. And so he thinks that something more is um, properly working faculty. So he has an externalist view of knowledge. Um, and so he sees that Something like a knowledge of God is grounded in a sensus divinitatis, so a faculty that we have that we can know God directly, and so that we don't need, you know, evidence is sort of a middleman that we don't need, that we can um, know and understand God um, directly through this faculty of, you know, a perception of the divine. Yeah, and I agree with Plantinga on the properly basic beliefs thing as far as being non-inferential, non dosaskly non-inferential and non-dosaskly justifiable, but I don't get into the sense of divinitatis that he, you know, automatically just by by fiat says, you know, we all know of God and therefore blah, blah, blah. But Sai, you, are you just are, are you doing against Plantinga's version of reformed epistemology? Well, you know, I would say um, I'm not against evidential. I'm not against evidences. I'm against evidentialism. Because that is trying to convince people that a God exists with evidences. Mm -hmm. And I would say that's contrary to what Scripture says. I know that there's pushback here, but that's what I believe the Bible says. Um, so I'm, I'm not against evidences. And if a, if a person uses evidential arguments, if they said to me, I'm not using evidences to convince these people that God exists. I'm using evidences to expose the suppression of truth. I'd say, go nuts. But they don't do that. And I, I think that when they do it in a way that tries to convince people that God exists with evidences, it's contrary to what Scripture says. And I think that what Christians have to admit is that the Bible says some incredible things. It says a donkey talk. It says a man was in a fish for three days, or a man was dead and came back. But to try and use evidence to convince people of that, you know, I think it's, it's just... You know, like, like I tell people, if you can have a, a leather-bound uh, original of the Bible, and you can hand it to somebody, uh, an unbeliever, and they just flip you know, through the page and say, look, it's donkey talking donkey you found the original of of, uh, of a fairy tale you guys are nuts so to try and use evidence is to convince people of that i think it's just a waste well, of time well let me ask chris and dave would you think that evidentialism could be used to, to do the opposite say look you know if the bible says that a, a person was in a, a, a fish for three days we know that's biologically not possible if the earth you know if it says that a you know um a, a donkey talk we know that's not biologically possible um do you guys agree that evidentialism would be a way to at least argue there is no God, or that at least the Christian version is false? Well, I, I yeah. wanted to make a bit of a clarification. So I, I just take evidentialism to be the basically the thesis that the justification for a person's belief is directly proportionate to the quality of their evidence. So strictly speaking, it has nothing yeah. to do with the motivations of the Hold person. A you get, get, I think we need a mute. I, get, Chris is, I hear a lot of background noise. You do? Yeah. yeah. Uh, so... Sai, it seemed to me like you're saying you're against oh, yeah, evidentialism cool. when it's done with a motivation to try to convince people through evidence as opposed to suppress uh, unbelief. 
But the motivations of the person involved, strictly speaking, have nothing to do with evidentialism. Evidentialism is just a thesis about what it takes or what constitutes a justified belief yeah, exactly. without recourse to what the motivation is to the person presenting exactly. the evidence. Yeah, yeah well, I'm just I'm just commenting on all the evidentialists I've ever heard. So if you want to define ev evidentialism as presenting evidence to expose the suppression truth, I say, you know, I, I have no problem with that. But you're opposed to... to He's going to argue. I think though, you're opposed to evidential lists, then, not to evidentialism. That's fair. Well, the, or the way they're okay. using it. He, well, my understanding of evidentialism, and maybe I have a false understanding of it, but uh, the way evidentialists portray evidentialism, it's my understanding that it is to convince people that God exists through the means of evidence. And if that's not the case, well, I don't I mean, mind. It it's implied. I mean, evidentialism, as he said, right. it's a way to use evidence to rationally justify a position, a belief. That's all. Yeah. Yeah, and so of course, you know, I, I believe according to scripture that everyone has sufficient knowledge of God and that to use evidence is to convince them of that is a denial of what scripture says. And I know that, you know, in your last show, people deny that that's the, the reading of Romans 1, but I think it's echoed throughout scripture. And so that is my position. So that is why I have a problem because um, I believe that people who go about it that way negate what the Bible says. I, Could you show me anywhere in Romans 1 where it says everyone knows that God exists? Well, it, it says that they're truth suppressors because what is, what is where does it say character? everyone? I thought it was talking about just the people of the of the church at the time the, from the um the, was it current? It, it says they and scholars mm. are disputing who they are. Scholars, like yeah, but I think if you read if you, who that refers, was, was it a I think if you that read, fell away from the church that he was referring to, if I'm not mistaken, in Romans, he was talking about well, people like that I say, fell away. it's not only Romans, but if you read through uh, the rest of the book, there are de definitely a generalized statements. You know that I think apply to everyone, but it's 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 the fool who has said in his heart there is no God. It's not only in Romans; it's throughout Scripture. So, um, you know, I think that's the it's, it's clear there, but I don't think it's only um, addressed to the people that uh, Paul was writing to. But a person could be could foolishly say that there is no God. How would that? How would you make the inference from a person is foolish for saying in their heart that there is no God? Therefore, they do know that there is a God. I, I don't see how that follows. Well, I, well, I think it's starting with the basis that, God, that people know there's no God. He started with that precept. He's not making. I know. And I'm belief. asking if he could justify it because he's saying he can justify it from well, scripture. He's not going to justify because it it's a presupposition, right? Uh, no, right. But, so <laughs> it's the very thing that's. It's, it's well, his, his presupposition is his presupposition well, is. Well, help me out, David. I don't think. Help me out. Help, help me out, then, David. Uh, why else would it be foolish? On the basis of the overwhelming evidence for God's existence. I, yeah, I, again, and I don't think that would leave them without excuse. Okay, why would they not? How, why would they have an excuse if the evidence is overwhelming that God exists? Well, they, they might not be a good excuse, but uh, it would follow logically that they would have an, ex, an, an excuse. How does it follow? Well, because it's not certain. God is not certain. I was not saved by a probability. It, it reduces God to a probability, and there's nowhere in Scripture that God is presented as a probability. So well, probability is a is a epistemic that's thing. A, yeah, exactly. It's that's about, how we view yeah, it. You can't say that a being is a probability. Yeah. God, probability God exists applies or does not to exist. Right. Not to beings. Right. right. Yeah, it, no, but the, the thing is, the way that God is, the way that He's presented that way is that He probably exists. Well, yeah, but so, but God either exists or does not exist. Our our understanding whether God exists or not is. Can be based on probabilities. You can you can re, you can reduce that probabilities, but that doesn't mean well, I, I would, that I would, it changes I would any say, effect ontologically. Just because we say something has a 50-50 probability or ninety percent probability, that's stoch uh, sto uh, stochastic. We, that's just means that we don't have information privy to us to to give a higher confidence level. That's all it is, stochastic. But whether God exists or not is a binary condition. Well, yeah, no, no, that's fair. Um, well, actually, I wouldn't even say it's binary, but I would say that a Christian cannot it's... state that. No, I know, but the thing is, I would say it's it's certain that he exists. So right, it's not right, binary. no, I, that's fine, but that's a kind of confidence level. It is the case that God exists or does not exist, but you're however, I, that he does. I, I, yeah. However, my point is that a Christian could not say that God probably exists. Why can't they? Because yeah. then he probably then then there is a possibility that he doesn't. No, no, and not at all. Fine. No, if if Christian says God probably exists, he can actually that is a subset of certainty. I don't know. I know. I know. I think size making a point here in the that if we're saying that our knowledge of God is probabilistic, you know, there's a probabilistic oh, space in okay. which it, some it, possible okay. worlds okay. God exists and other possible worlds I'll God doesn't that. exist. All right. 
I'll give him that. He's talking about if possible world theory, then yes, then then Saitem would probably be right. Well, so that's well, well, well that's just that's just modal language. Yeah, so. yeah, no, I, and I, I, we had we, it's funny because Ben and I just had a, a video not too long ago on modal logic. Well, so, well, Sai, I mean, when when you say that a, a Christian believes that God exists, or or believes in Christianity in general, not because um, he saw a bunch of evidences and, and then that convinced him first. Rather that he was regenerated first, and then you just have you know later things to confirm that. But it, that wasn't the the thing that started. That wasn't that wasn't the the, uh, the uh, primary thing that made them become a Christian. It was because they were regenerated by God first, right? Is it, is it well, I think about that, God, right? I think God can use evidences in that process, but I don't believe it's the evidences that does it because then their reasoning is the ultimate authority, and and not God. God converts people. And that's why, you know, even shows like this and, you know, watching stuff, I'm really not that interested in doing them, um, you know, in the way I guess that I did in the past, because I think that a lot of the times in the past, evidentialists were duped into believing that evidences are going to convince people that God exists. And now presuppositionists are duped into the idea that philosophy is going to convince the people that God exists. But God, that puts God at the end of the argument rather than the beginning of the argument. And I think that's a denial of presuppositionalism. So I'm I'm sick. I'm, you know, I think the more that I do this, the more tired I get of the arguments. So, so I, I, in a nutshell, would it make sense for you to say um, the evidences lead to people to realize what they already know? Um, yeah, you know, I, I, I think, I think that's, uh, that's closer. It, um, so what, what I would say is that people do not go from unbelief to belief. They go from suppressing the truth to professing the truth. Okay, and, that, and that'd be consistent with a presupposition, though. There is no unbelief, though, in a presupposition. I'll, I'll be our believers. Just, well, well just we got to be careful with that because the uh, uh, scripture calls people unbelievers. Mm -hmm. But um, you know, I would think that the consistent uh, view of them is a truth suppressor. Well, that's also an English. The the unbeliever is an English translation. Translation. So I I'll, I'll be the first to admit I don't know Hebrew or really Latin or Greek or anything or anything like that. So uh, what what is the scholarship on the translation of those terms from their original text? Is unbeliever a fair translation? I, I honestly don't know. I think it's a good, good question, actually, because unbelief in English language just means somebody who doesn't believe something. It's a, it's a non-position, right? So you have belief, non -be you have belief is P, disbelief P, which means belief P is false. And then you have unbelief, which is you don't believe P nor not P. That's just how it's understood in, in, in epistemology. All right, well, let's move on to the next one. Next one I want to, is kind of related to the first one. It's just, I, I said, um, the, the God seems to be playing this game of celestial hide and seek. Um, you know, I was a theist at one time. I think, um, I, I, I know Chris was, and I'm, I'm not sure if Ben was. Yes, yeah, yes, yeah, I was I'm, I was raised yeah, Christian. Yeah, so, so we've all been there. And then, you know, and so it's not like any of us are against theism as a whole. When I, I'm not an anti-theist. Um, there are some things about religion right. I have problems with, um, and, and I'm happy to regard to, to anti-theism as far as to certain types of religion. But as far as like the concept of God, I, I, I'm not against that. And so as a non-resistant non-believer, you know, I, 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 I thought I, I was a theist. You know, I thought I believed in God at one time. So, but it wasn't justified. And so... Uh, why isn't now, what am I suppressing? I, I mean, I don't know what I'm suppressing. I've, I've looked, I've, I've said, okay, if God exists, I just want, I'd like to know, but I don't have any ability to just say, Hey God, show me. It, it just, it, I did that when I was a theist. I never got anything from him. I just kind of attributed things, uh, I think unjustifiably to him, but I never had any firsthand okay. experience of God or Jesus. I've never seen or talked to either one of them. Right. In Romans chapter one, though, it talks about God's invisible qualities. And I think those are the in invisible qualities that, that you um, just accept as blind faith claims. You say everybody has blind faith claims and you just accept those and go on from them. But I say those things that you have blind faith in are actually qualities of God. And those are the kind of things that God has revealed himself as it says in Romans one, his invisible qualities, things like love, things like logic. These are invisible qualities, which you accept. You accept ultimate. Uh, you accept um, 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 absolute morality. You accept the laws of logic, well, I, and you say, I, "But these I, are." I accept, I accept objective morality. I'm not really an absolute moralist. Okay, yeah, but that's fine. But I would say that that these things are invisible qualities of God that you say we just accept as blind faith, and you move on from them. Mm -hmm. And as a presuppositionist, I say, "Well, we can't really move on from them." And I say that would be an indication of your knowledge of God, and you you just want to slough that off as a blind faith claim and move on. And I would say that that would be an, an area that I would want you to. Um, 
to delve into as to you and, know and it's fair response look i i do accept blind faith commitments um i've had this conversation before though people i do accept blind faith commitments um i don't think they're justifiable i think they're um some th things that just everybody has to accept by blind faith um but i uh, to, for my audience to understand about the presuppositional point of view the reformed epistemological point of view it's basically they're trying to give an accounting for the things that i take as blind faith Right. They're trying to say, OK, we don't have to take them as blind faith. We have somebody who was an observed witness at the time of all this stuff that knows all these things. And by God, we can learn that these things are the, the, the truth. And therefore, we can have a justification or accounting of things like rationalization, induction, truth, knowledge and things of that nature. Correct. That, that's a good summation of how precept argument would work. Yeah, I think that's fair. Okay. Um, ben or Doesn't Dave? Doesn't that just kick the can back, though? Because then we can just ask, isn't that just a blind faith commitment in God? Yeah, the difference would be is that God does, can and does make us certain of these things. So, uh, but the thing we is, we should probably I, I, define blind faith here as opposed to non blind faith. I don't know how y'all are using that term. Blind so faith, I just, not... basically, um, like, for example, I have to assume external minds exist, I have to assume reality to even begin to reason before i could even begin also, to reason blind that, faith is an assumption yeah blind faith is just, an just an unjustified assumption. belief i would Un say unjustifiable unjustified unwarrantable uh belief that we all have to assume is an ingredient for rationality so so what would non-blind faith look like um contingent trust yeah one one plus one equals two obviously that a priori knowledge <laughs> you know um yeah but i mean even if i even if i have reasons to believe something if, if chris tells me something like he says, he's got a dog. I know him. He seems, you know, pretty reasonable and honest. I'm going to believe that he got a dog. That's not blind. So, faith. how well does this does this concept of faith poured over to the theological understanding of faith that Sam? Not well. Not well. It, it, that's the problem. There's an equivocation there. Well, so so we might we might yeah. So I I would just put a flag here that um we you know these disagreeing parties might be talking past one another more than it might seem. But, but you know it's funny there shouldn't be any equivocation they should literally be the same thing blind faith in the the philosophy should be the same as theology it just basically means an unjustified position that you have no reason you have no warrantable reason to accept other than well, well i mean obviously in an ideal world yeah we yeah. would we would just all agree on the concepts we're using but sure. yeah. <laughs> um, well, from a christian perspective faith is actually defined to find in hebrews 11 one faith is the assurance of things hoped for the conviction of things not seen and i like the 1974 niv it says the certain of things hoped for and the conviction of things not seen. it talks about a certain and i would say that faith in god is foundational not only for mine reasoning, but for all of your reasoning as well. But that's, that's, again, but that's based on so, pistis, so, right? Oh, I, I had a, I had another follow up question for Sai yeah. uh, for to help for clarification for the audience. So, um, standard definitions of knowledge roughly approximate to justified true belief, but you know, obviously Gettier showed us that there's got to be something more. Like that might be necessary for knowledge, but it's not sufficient. So there has to be something else put into this picture. Um, Sai, is it fair to say that certainty is that missing piece to knowledge? That 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 the thing that can make just uh, justified true belief sufficient for knowledge is certainty, or is that a misrepresentation? Yeah. Well, the thing is, I have uh, no problem with the standard definition of uh, knowledge. How, however, um, people always harp on the idea of certainty, and it's my position that you cannot have knowledge even to 1% without uh, presupposing, without starting with God. So the whole idea of certainty being element, an element of it, I just don't know how you can have knowledge that is not certain. I would not call that knowledge. I would call that a false knowledge. Okay, so so there's there's two types of weak acceptance cases for knowledge. There's the strong acceptance case and the weak. The strong acceptance case would be knowledge requires certainty. That's not really prevalent uh, most part in philosophy. Philosophy, for generally speaking, they have the weak acceptance case. Knowledge just requires the proposition to be true, you believe the proposition and it's justified it doesn't require certainty uh, certainty would be that extra element that i think is would be very difficult to really to ascertain to to acquire knowledge i i do like the fact you can add other things to justify true belief called truth tracking conditions to to, to help resolve the Gettier problems but even if you do that it has been shown by dr linda zabeski that any belief first uh theory where you have knowledge, where you have belief as a condition, will have what's called epistemic luck issues, and where they all have Gettier problems. So you can't get around it, uh, but it's still, I think, the best theory of knowledge you can use for these types of discussions. But 
Um, can, and there's no there's resolution there's, to that. It's every, can, every, we, can we bracket like Getty or cases unless we have to and just work with justified true belief? Yeah, like, yeah, that's why I like do it because it's still well, the best so, we but, got. But, it, but if we do that, that's so what I fear is that we've then begged the question against Psy, who has this other feature that's essential to knowledge, that's certainty. And so what I what I think, and correct me if I'm wrong in this side, is what motivates this is that most people find it intuitively obvious that we couldn't know something that's false. Like if we know something, right. it entails that it's true. Right. And so the idea of us knowing something and it being false just doesn't make any sense. Yeah, and right. I don't find it, I don't feel that plausible to actually be absolutely certain in any Cartesian sense of anything that's a posteriori. I, I don't know how that would really be. Oh, we got a question here. Uh, Floyd, do you want to ask something? Well, yeah, I, I just don't know how, you know, certainty plays plays a, a role or an ingredient in knowledge. You know, what, what does it mean to say you're certain? It means you can't be wrong. Indubitable. Well, you know, in, 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 do we or yeah. confidence, well, the confidence we have in a proposition? Is well, you, you can be absolutely confident, but be totally wrong, right? A, a, so for I, all of X, right. X equals X is, is true I, in all possible. I, I think, so, I think, so if I think size certainty, certainty is a proper... talking about pro epistemic certainty. Epistemic well, certainty. ask yeah. yourself, if you have a... Yeah, that's a good distinction to make. If you have a true belief, regardless if you're justified in believing it or not, is there any possible way that belief can be wrong? If, if you actually hold a true belief, can you actually... No, you... matter of fact, I, it's funny you mention that because I've argued that. I've gone to Facebook groups, and I don't know if you guys have seen Facebook atheist, theist groups. They're just, they're mind-blowing how, how, how Pavlonian they are, and all these knee-jerk reactions. And I've actually said that exact same thing. Super toxic. Oh, my God. <laughs> it's bizarre, dude. So, Floyd, I actually said something along the lines of, if, if a theist knows, if it is the case, if it is the case, it's a conjunctional implication, if it is the case that a theist knows that God exists, then God must exist. That is a logically true statement. There's nothing wrong with that, is there, Dave or Ben? It is a fact that if it is the case that a theist knows that God exists, then God must exist. Why? Because it's transcendental argument. God, it, God, God existing must be true in order for the... the Theist to know, and if the theist knows, there yes, if, it's a that's what they that mean exists, by right? no. Like if, if they so lost they, their minds on that, they yeah, became but, an idiot. Yeah. Um, the the well, element that I would focus on is the element of truth uh, of knowledge, which is truth. And I just it does not make sense to me that something could know somebody could know something to be true, which is actually false. You can't. Nobody right. here agrees. Yeah. Nobody yeah. thinks so. I mean, even even not using the term certainty, I think it must be true. But, but determining what is true is the difficult part, right? We can determine things exactly. that are vertically true analytically. That's why I think a priori knowledge is, is fine because any kind of analytic truth we can we can establish as to be objectively true. But when it comes to things like does something exist, then you get into a whole uh, – there's so many different you know, problems ontologically and epistemically with saying, you know, such and such exists. Because you get into mirological nihilism, you get into, you know, quantum mechanics. You, you, we, we don't even know what exist means anymore, it seems. But, you know, to have a certainty of things that we observe – how could we have any kind of epistemic certainty as in, as in like a Cartesian sense? I, I don't think we really can, although I accept our orientation on it. But God existing is an ontological claim. I don't know how somebody would have certainty on that of um, any real consequence. Unless well, this, this brings us to Descartes. I mean, this takes us right to the beginning of the Enlightenment. You know, what can we, you know, can we start off with something certain, you know, like, there is thinking going on. Yeah, or, but Descartes you know, started with the, he actually, his argument was that God exists, therefore we can't have all those other problems. Well, so he appealed to an ontological he, 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 argument. He, he, he actually, he wasn't, his, his whole epistemology was grounded in that God existed. So in that way, you know, he wasn't like a, a skeptic like we would, would kind of think of now. His, well, his, well, so so he, so keep, you know, he famously said, I think, therefore I am. And so that that's the thing where he could start. But before he got there, he was reflecting on his senses. Mm -hmm. And he was, he imagined this evil demon that was manipulating his rational fact his sense data and his rational faculties such that this evil demon could convince him that you know two plus two might be five um and so the way the way i see him getting around that was by appealing to the ontological argument and saying look there is no such evil demon because the greatest perfection wouldn't allow it. must yeah. exist yeah and he would, um, yeah exactly yeah and so that, that i i don't think that's a good way to do um skepticism myself but um, you know, he, well, he he lived a long time ago. He, put, he I think if you don't, lived don't now, say anything bad about Descartes. Or no, David hey, look, I respect you, Descartes, but David you know, is coming for you. But Descartes, I'll just say, you know. yeah, better not, man. We'll jump you for the homie. <laughs> I think that Steve agrees with me though, that Descartes, Descartes was begging the question. Yeah, yeah, I, and I think so because, in, in particular regards, one, he self he was self referential. He assumed I. 
to even begin to cogito. Well, no, well, so you don't have to interpret as, as saying that there is an I. You just say there is thinking going on. And that's the only thing I get you, you can get to. It. When it comes to the cogito, I could think that Descartes nailed that there's thinking going on. Something is being thought. There's a thinking process going and, on. But what's And, and so he knew that he wasn't omniscient. Yeah. yeah. So, I mean, like, these are things that, like, I think there are, you know, there are truth that we can be certain about but they're just few and far between yeah I think and I that's think one of the things people. like descartes really sh brought that out clearly of oh wow we you know we don't actually have as much indubitable knowledge as we might have thought before we started this skeptical process that he's writing about in the bathtub for some yep. reason no i agree with that all right let's move on to the next one um this one is a is a more of a unique one i call this one no objective truth makers and what i mean by this time is that unlike other things we can say hey look um i have a cup okay well what's the evidence you have a cup again going back to evidentialism sorry but you know i show a cup and i think that's a reasonable justification to say yes yeah, steve actually has a cup in his hand right um a reasonable inference and so when i say there's no objective truth makers i can't point and go hey look there's god or there's no god there's no objective truth in the matter to be had there from a non-believer point of view i understand you know obviously from your point of view there is but you know, if, if we're trying to, to you know, sway people uh, one way or another, and I know that you start from the presupposition, but from the non-believer point of view, if we're trying to sway people, um, we would ask the theist to say, well, okay, so what is the objective truth maker that you have that will, you know, convince a non-believer that God exists, right? It's not a matter of precept at that point. It's a matter of what will convince a non-believer because there's no objective truth maker to be had. And if God is being this omnipresent, omnipotent being, there should be indications of an objective fact that he exists. Just like, you know, there's an objective fact that a cup exists. If he exists, there should be an objective fact of the matter there. That just doesn't seem to be. Yeah, but that's a, that's a question for evidentialists because nothing yes. convinces a person that a God exists. I, I would say that everybody knows that God exists. And I would say that the very question presupposes that he exists. Because you say there's no objective truth makers. I say truth is the objective truth maker. One of them. That's... That's kind of begging the question, though. I mean, what what what? Oh, no, I... The very concept of truth, I could point to that, and I say you cannot get that without God. Yeah, but that's again from the precept. I, again, I, we're talking right. from an evidential point of view. Uh, truth, you know, both, most of us, I think, probably go to the to correspondence theory of truth. That what comports with reality is. It's simple. It's it, obviously, I, I think, deflationary theory works as well, and even um, correspondence theory of truth. But for the most part, when we say a causal theory, we'll we'll say. Hey, look! What it makes this position, this proposition that a cup uh, exists is true. Well, there's there's a cup that makes it true. That's the truth condition or truth maker, I should say, that actually makes that proposition true. But, yeah, but, but you, you, you glean over a lot of things that I say you can't get without God. You know, because uh, you know you have to trust the validity of your reasoning in order to know what is real. And that's but, a question that I ask people, and people don't like when I do that. But I say, how do you know it's real? And I would say without uh, divine revelation, we can't know what. All right. Well, let me let well, Chris. So, oh, Dave, go ahead, and then Chris. Well, so I so I just want to uh, to be clear. Are you saying you don't think a person can get truth apart from God, or that they cannot know truth apart from God? I say the very concept of of truth is absurd without God. It's it's impossible. Why? Because um, if if your for instance, if your theory is truth is that which comports with reality, without revelation from God who knows everything, we can't even know what's real. But see, that's different. It's saying you can't know truth without God. It's not. It's not saying you can't have truth. Well, if, God. if the definition of truth involves um, something being real, then the very definition does not make sense without the God who lets us know what's real. So, so God. Let's say, well, let's say hypothetically. I know you don't like hypotheticals. But let's say there there is no God. Let's say it is the the, the the case that at least the Christian God that we're describing does not exist. Um, would would all facts and th and truths just cease to be true? Well, I, I, I can't even entertain that hypothetical because, you know, that's what I was saying earlier about the possible. So in size view, and mm -hmm. again, Sai, correct me if I'm wrong, is that God's going to be in all possible worlds. So if you're imagining a possible there, world there, where there is right. no God, yeah. you would just there would there is no such possible world. And we've now, contradicted with, our, with, with we've now contradicted ourselves within that model. Well, yeah, I think that's fair because when I see, and you know, you got it from my perspective, when I see you arguing these things, it, to me, it appears like a, a bunch of guys, not to be offensive or mm -hmm. anything, but arguing how much yellow weighs. Yeah, no, I, don't I get, get it. it. No, I, 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 I believe it or not, from an internal critique, you're consistent. 
you know, and, and you're, I know we're vacillating between externalism and internalism and doing external critique and eisegesis versus exegesis. I know we're, we're vacillating. I get that. Um, but from your perspective, it's consistent. I will give you this. And as, as Ben, ben brilliantly points out, if it is the case that God exists in all possible worlds, then you cannot even have a hypothetical case where you have a possible world where he doesn't exist to even have a counterfactual conditions. So it would be, from your point of view, nonsensical to even entertain a hypothetical where there is no God. I, I get that. But from an externalist point of view, we can do that. Yeah, borrowing from him all the while. <laughs> yeah, yeah, so so size often a transcendental claim that, that his God is necessary for knowledge. Mm -hmm. um, but why can't under other metaphysical assumptions uh, there be knowledge? You know, the question is, why is God, why is the Christian God necessary for for any human to possess a, a knowledge kind? That That's a great question. That, that's a fundamental question, I think. Yeah, so I'm going to give you an example. I, 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 I'm going to make a knowledge claim right now that there's a computer monitor in front of me right now. That's, that's, that's a knowledge claim. Now, um, how in my worldview, where there is where there is no Christian God, um, how can I have that knowledge? You know, what can I have that? Well, I think there's three conditions for me to have knowledge that there's a computer monitor in front of me right now. Uh, one would be that I believe that there's a computer monitor in front of me right, right now. That'd be the dosasic uh, condition. Uh, the second condition would be there's, there's, there's actually a computer monitor in front of me right, right now. That'd be the metaphysical truth condition. Or ontological condition, yep. Right. Mm -hmm. And and then, and then uh, the third is the uh, justification condition. That the computer mo that the uh, computer monitor in front of me actually caused my belief that there is a computer monitor, monitor which is epistemic me. justification, right? So if 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 I don't have those threes, then I don't know it. But if I do have those three conditions, then I can have knowledge that there's a computer a monitor in front of me. Now I, I presented an example of a knowledge claim that I I think uh, can be justified, and the Christian God is not anywhere it's not, in. We're not one of those three conditions. You're right, right. So, you know, so what's wrong with that model of, of epistemology? Well, I, I would say, first of all, if you say that it's true, what is your definition of truth? And if you say truth is that which supports with reality, how do you know what's real? How do you know that your reasoning about what's real is even valid? And those things I, I see are glossed over when people present these options. I, and and for me, it, you know, it's it's that's what, why when I do these type of things, I say it's a work of the Holy Spirit that's going to have to open people's eyes to see what they're just simply glossing over and not giving God credit for. Isn't because that, you see, there's a well, well, the thing is, I, I'm going to reason from my presuppositions. I mean, Greg Bonson said uh, that 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 claim we reason by presupposition. So I'm going to start with my my non-Christian presuppositions and, and reason from them. You know, if you're going to present a transcendental argument, you have to show that my non-Christian presuppositions leads to some sort of ad abductium ad absurdum. So I seem to take more of a Vantil approach, though. His, his approach but, but, seems to be more that the Holy Ghost. But, what but, is your presupposition that your reasoning is valid? Is that one of your presuppositions? Right. Yes. Yeah. That we have. Yeah. We. I, I presuppose that our cognitive faculties are. Right. Um, yeah. I presuppose People that. With functioning properties. So Alvin Plantinga would here say that you know it's a properly basic belief that my cognitive faculties are working properly. Right. And a Christian has to do the same thing. Now, a Christian has a just so causal explanation. But they still have to assume that their reasoning is correct. I mean, they have to make a yeah. certain assumptions that they're the, not the doing is, well. You have to assume the your senses are correct, that your uh, cognitive abilities are correct to be able to read the Bible, to be able to receive revelation. Or that God is God. telling them correct information. The problem is right. that there are people with incorrect reasoning who could say the same thing. Sure. Doesn't mean right. they're right, though. That's the point. No, that, that's yeah. fine. So that's why when it's yeah. a basis for truth without revelation from God, but, it's, yeah. it's arbitrary. It's, but, but that's <laughs> the case in both the Christian and non Christian world. Yeah, so that, the can I propose? Both. An alternative. Uh, Sai, what if I wanted to say that I had a belief that was justified non-inferentially? And I, it wouldn't matter if, uh, you know, my if I had the ability to reason or not, because this is a belief that's not being reached as the result of a chain or process of inference. There's no reasoning going on. It's justified non-inferentially. Well, uh, I would say... Even even formulating the words to share that with me is makes assumptions that cannot be justified without God. Because you're, for instance, uniformity of nature, and I know you know Steve's talked about that as well. But when you communicate those things to me, you're assuming that those words that you utter into the ether mean the same thing they did five seconds ago. And I'm saying without God, there is no uh, basis for uh, for assuming that the future will be like the past. 
So first of all, I'm a semantic internalist. I don't believe that uh, meaning is something that's external uh, to myself. Words just have the meanings that I give to them. And so in virtue of my own acquaintance with the definitions of uh, the words that I use, that's how I'm going to know that they have the same meaning. Uh, second, I mean, problem of induction, uh, in my opinion, has been solved by, you know, D.C. Williams, D.C. Stove, Tim McGrew. I, 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 read on my I read Steve. McGrew. I read McGrew's work. Did you say this guy was on my side, Steve? <laughs> yeah, no, he, I, yeah, uh, Dave is, look, Dave. In a sense. Dave, I, I just, I, I'm, I, I, I'm, 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 I'm been, in the sense that I'm a Christian. Yeah. I'm, an, I'm a Christian evidentialist. I couldn't He's oppose your presuppositionalism yeah. more strongly. But uh, yeah, he, he he he's he's not a young earth creationist or anything like that. But he is a Christian, and he's very he's very well knowledgeable about philosophy. And on the other end of the spectrum, you got, you got Ben. You know, so Ben and Dave are like a, they're like the opposites of each other. Uh, they're both philosophically uh, literate, but one's a Christian and one's an atheist, and so it's a very interesting dichotomy between. It's them. it's really exciting for me too. So um, my favorite book of philosophy of all time is Hume's Dialogues Concerning Natural Religion. And so he has three characters, Philo, um, Cleanthes, and Demia. And so all three of those characters are here tonight. Um, so Sai, yeah, Sai has the, is the Demia, who is opposed to kind of the natural theology, empirical methods of Cleanthes, which is David. And, and I get to play Philo, and it's awesome. <laughs> all right, uh, David's, get, David's got to go back to work for a while. Uh, thanks, David. If you come back, that's that's great too. But we, we definitely appreciate you coming on. Um, yeah, no, I love the fact that we all can get different uh, positions and stuff like that. Um, all right, so let's move on to the next one. This one's a little more, I think, more formidable. Uh, this is one of my bigger issues with um, the omni-benevolent type being that has om omnipotence and omniscience and that has the power to fix things, the knowledge to do it, the ability to do it, but not seemingly the want to do it. And this is the moral monstrosities argument. This is the um, evidence, just a variation problem of, of evil. problem of evil, right. So we see a lot of moral monstrosities happen uh, in both natural evils and man evils. And I know there's going to be theodicies that we can talk about as far as like free will and all those things. And, and, and it's understood. But as far as the existence of evil as a whole, first of all, the natural amount of natural evil in the world is a preset amount. There's a finite amount. And the argument would be, why is it that exactly that exact amount? Why is there like one, if I stub my toe 50 times in my life rather than 49, what did I learn different? If there's one less hurricane on the planet, what is the difference? Why is it exactly the amount of evil and, evil and moral monstrosities that exist uh, in, in the world? Um, why does God want this exact amount? And, and obviously, I think an argument to say, well, that's just God wants is not, is not going to be a counter argument to that. Are you asking me? Yeah. Yeah, well, of course, as a presupposition, I would say the very objection to evil assumes God exists because if we're just matter in motion, there's no evil. Whatever well, no, happens, no, happens. I don't think so. I mean, look, if, we, if, if we're if we're going to say evil is something that just has harm, right? A, a hurricane has no intentionality. It's just a weather. No, no, but the thing is, but the thing is, uh, harm is uh, is arbitrary as well without an absolute standard. What's one person's harm is another person's, you know. Yeah, I, I, could, I could completely disagree with that, but that gets into moral theory. But if we if we make the assumption that there is harm, we both agree that that certain things are harmful correct but you see you're doing it again though because you want to start with an assumption that something is objectively harmful and i'm saying that you can't do that without god it doesn't so we can end up... subjectively i i it, it, it really makes no difference if you want to subjectively think that a hurricane is not harmful that's fine but I, the point is we yeah, both but do the thing agree is, that it's harmful but i think it's a it's a it's a good argument to say god does what he does because there is an example of this in scripture as well and like i say like the the example of job and Job, for four chapters, he's saying, why, God, why? And his friends are telling him all these different things. And, and God finally answers Job. And what does he say? Where were you when I created the world? And what does Job do? He put his hand in front of his mouth. He spoke too soon. And I think when we question God about why these things, I don't know why. I mean, I can look at my own life, the stuff that's going on. And not only do I not question God, I thank him for it. Because God works all things for the good of those who love him. And so we will even look at the things that happen in this world in a different thing. And I'm glad that you believe that there are objectively evil things. Because there's oh, sure. Christians who won't even say that there are. Yeah. No, Christians I, I, will make that, the, the I, dumb I, argument saying it's just an absence of God. I think, I think a lot of it. Yeah, that's, that's, that's called priva privation of evil. Right. That I, might be I, I a definition like that. of evil. Yeah. That might be a definition of evil. Ooh, that was loud. That might be a definition of evil. Chris, Chris, sorry. Yeah. Lots, yeah. Lots, of, lots of background noise. That yeah, might Chris. be a definition of evil, but it certainly can't be a reason for evil. Yeah, I, I don't think privation of evil is a good argument. Um, but the privation, people say, you know, just like um, you can't define cold, it's an absence of heat. You can't define darkness, it's an absence of light. But I say, who controls the light switch? 
who controls the thermostat? You're right back to square one. I think it's a stupid argument. And Christians share that that thing with Einstein, you know, supposedly challenging the professor, and they share it. And they love oh, it. Yeah, they, they put a lot of nonsense out. They never have. And and also, you know, it's funny. It's, uh, most atheist philosophers that I know that are theologians, uh, at least theologically uh, in, in um uh, knowledgeable. Most of them are objective moral uh, moralists. They actually do accept. They, that doesn't mean that all object morality is objective by any stretch. No, I'm measure. really excited. Just mean that really one thanked. thing is, and I, I think Ben is objective moralist. Well, I'm oh really yeah, I'm, a, I'm, yeah. I'm an objectivist. Yes. Yeah, me too. I'm and, really thankful and, for your inconsistency. You know, well, you know, it's so funny. We get a lot of crap for it as non-believers because people are like, how could you accept objective morality and not accept God? Because I'm like, we believe that we don't need God to have objective morality. That's why. Um, yeah, but I, I'm glad that you accept it, but I think I would agree with them. Yeah, no, and and, and I understand your reasoning on that, tr truly. But I think it's weird to think that most atheist philosophers do accept objective morality, and a lot of atheists that just exclude it by fiat don't understand moral theory very well. Because they have really no great arguments against it, uh, they just basically have this misconceptions, I think, of what objective morality actually really entails, and they conflate it with ab absolute morality, and they're not the same thing. Because absolute morality is the the the, the abs opposite pole of relative morality, not subjective. What do you morality. think of what do you think of T jumps theory? <laughs> the great, you know, T jumps <laughs> writing a book called I think he's, I I gave him the title for it. It's I, I told him he should call it the the great big book of T jumps epistemology, because uh, he his claims that his he claims I'm not even kidding. He, and I get along with T-Jump nowadays. You know, we've had our past, but I get along with him. Um, he claims that his moral theory can can rebuke any th argument. That's what he's been testing for all these years. Did, he, and did I, you see the recent one he did on GG's channel? Did you watch that? I have it. I, I have it on tab. It's an hour long, though, and I haven't no, watched it's like, it yet. I'm not familiar with the guy you talked to. Is that guy a believer, or is he uh, an unbeliever? The guy, F uh, Fusion? Or, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I haven't watched yeah. it yet. I have it on tab. Somebody had, had recommended it to me, so I will be I'd really it. be interested in seeing you doing a review of that. <laughs> yeah, I'm the other guy was an atheist. That, yeah, what's he, that? He's on Clubhouse quite often. He's an atheist. Uh, but I, I, I think when it comes to dealing with the problem of evil, whether it be the logical or the evidential problem of evil, um, I don't think we need to be concerned about having a definition of uh, or a view of evil uh, from a non-Christian perspective. I, I, I think the problem of evil should be addressed as an internal critique, you know, because you know, okay. I think the Christian will acknowledge there's evil in the world. So. Mm -hmm. Um, they have to explain it. So, you know, if you, if you turn to like Psalm 145, uh, uh, verse 9, for example, it says, the Lord, is good, uh, the, Lord, the Lord is good to all and his compassion over all that he has made. And, uh, and also later in verse 17, it says, the Lord is just in all his ways, kind in all his doings. Um, so if, if you then turn to the book of Job, where Job is asking God, you know, why God, why all this suffering and so forth. How does God answer? Does God answer a, a theodicy that his friends offered? No, God shoots all those friends down saying, no, no, where were you when, when I, uh, when I uh, you know, created the earth? You know, when I laid down the foundations, were you there? Are you able to do the mighty things uh, that I can do? Only, only when you meet you know, that will I, will I answer you. So what God is basically saying to Job is this, you know, sit down and shut up. I'm, I'm, the, I'm, the, I'm the ruler of the universe. You know, who, you know who, who are you? And we see that in Romans 9 as well. You know, who, you know, who are you, the clay, to, uh, to, you know, to complain against the mold? Well, I mean, by the way, God has a right to do that if he does exist. I, I, I wouldn't have a problem with that. I'd be like, hey, yo, I'm in charge. Yeah, I disagree I, with that, Steve. Know, but go ahead. But, well, by all means, I, I know you raised your hand. Uh, yeah, go ahead and answer that. Because I think, look, if you're, if you're the all-powerful creator, then you, uh, you get some saying. It doesn't mean he's all benevolent, though. No, no, I, I would have to say I disagree with that. I want to second what Floyd said and kind of go back to that whole uh, Job thing. No, I think that it would be, I think it would be actually be a better idea for God to just simply answer the question as to get to this might makes right cop out of saying, no, what I say goes, and that's the end of that. Or, or just saying, uh, yeah, like what Floyd said, sit down, shut up, and just accept it and move on. No, absolutely not. No, I yeah, want him to give yeah, me... Yeah. I would want him to give me a justification, an answer for why he would do something like that. And I think, yes, no, I, agree, after, I agree with you on that. I'm, and hold I'm on saying, a second, hold on a second, hold on a second. Just let me finish my thought. Uh, ADHD, I'll forget. I'm sorry. I don't mean to be rude. No, um, <laughs> but uh, basically for, for uh, crap, I think I forgot. But basically just that, no, I think that it's it would be incumbent upon God after putting Job through what he did put Job through, and yes, he is responsible, uh, and you can say Satan did it and all this. I don't care. God's responsible. 
um, because he's the one that allowed for it. And that's just, to me, that's sick. I, I don't like that. But um, the fact is, is that, uh, no, after putting me through all that, yeah, you most certainly owe me an answer, buddy, and I want to hear it. And I think, I think that makes a lot more sense than just to simply say, uh, no, sit down and shut up. No, how about you sit down and shut up? How about that? Um, wow. I, you know, that's the thing that, that's the thing that just amazes me, that, that people in this world are saying, no, God, you got to submit to my standards before I'll submit to yours. You know, and that's well, exactly God, God what happened. Yes. Good, though, yeah, no, no, no. It, but that's, it's, that's, it's, it's a mutual understanding. Side. That's exactly it's what happened. It's a mutual understanding that if you want a relationship with me, you will communicate with me. Otherwise, I'm sorry. Oh, I'm, man, I'm actually that's a little tired. Damn, I'm getting a little heated. I'm a little tired. Thank God, you will do this. Do you understand? I'm Chris. <laughs> Well, it, that's exactly well, what one, happened. It's, just, it's not just because I'm me, but after what you did to me, and, and my name, you know, if I was Job, after what you did to me, I think you, I think you owe it to me. I think God would owe that. Yeah, yeah but God himself would owe that. that. I, I do agree with your sentiment on that. But I would say that what happened to Job would be far worse than anything that happened to you. And what was Job's response? He put his hand in front of his mouth. He understood. Right, and that was a silly response. He shouldn't have done that. He should have stood up for himself and <laughs> said, you know, not only yes, it was a silly response. Because not only are you smarter than God. Yeah, okay, God's God. I don't care if he's Not only are you smarter God, than God, God you're smarter than Job. To me. Because the fact is, is that, yes, after doing what he did, he owes me an answer. And it, that's whether he's God or not. I don't well, care. Well, let me pause this to you guys. Let me pause this to you guys. Well, well, Job simply accepted that it was it was uh, beyond his understanding. Right. It's you know, beyond and that's, human and that's understanding. Fine. He's allowed to do that. But it, God did still to us. The, right. The but God, make me understand. Well, hang on. Why, God, why God, is it? Why is it? Why is it um, beyond God to give me some kind of an understanding? Why? What is it really that much to ask? I mean, we're talking about you know the God of all creation who can do all these different things, you know, and so that. But He can't just give me a simple answer did, other than did, did, did Mike God, makes right. Sit down, shut up, and accept it. Did, and move on. Did God give mankind the want to understand, the want to reason, the want to learn things and have explanations? Yes, He did. So for, for, for Chris asking this, He's just doing what God gave him the ability to do and yeah, wants him but to the, do. But, there's that quote too that a god that could be understood would not be worthy of worship, and he oh, wants yeah, to he try. Would. Actually, I would argue, Sai, that it would make him more worthy of worship because he's just giving a justification. It's called right. proper communication. If you want a relationship with me, you it's will so wild how and some of these don't claims want to are just fine, coming right no from the dialogues concerning natural religion. It's amazing. <laughs> like, it's wild. Like I'm, 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 I'm sorry. I'm just, I'm in awe, kind of in this exchange. I'm like, oh wow. This is awesome. <laughs> you, want to worship, you want to worship a God who will submit to you. Well, I don't I'm think sorry. it's a matter no, of No, I want to worship a, a God of, who has having, proper communication yeah, skills. That, That's what that, I want. That respects he has communicated, I want to, to understand. He has communicated himself Oh, I'm sorry, the but there's no, there, no, dude, there's no need to have a finality to the Bible. He can be, go, go beyond the Bible and just sit there and communicate with me. And just like we were talking about earlier, the same way he did in... Um, in uh, the Old Testament or New Testament, what I mean, I guess either. So, but he decided to discontinue that, disappear from the scene, seemingly, and uh, you know that's that's the end of that. And it's just that's, you know that's unfortunate. It's sad. I mean, we're talking about a God who's not even powerful enough to to communicate properly. That's silly. Do you know what the first thing in Scripture was? It was autonomy. God said, Which "Don't." Which I'm an advocate for. I'm Hang an on a second. For a that Right, exactly. God said, do not eat of this tree. Satan says, hath God really said? And what do Adam and Eve do? Well, it Satan looks like said, Satan had more wisdom. Well, let me finish. Let me finish. Satan Fair said enough. this. God, Adam and Eve say, Satan said this. God said this. I'm going to choose. You're doing exactly the same thing. And I'm saying that a God that would be subject, that would be lower of intelligence and a moral standard than you, would not be worthy of worship. Isn't that similar how, to how the... Does him offering an explanation make him less intelligent than me or at my level or whatever. I don't understand how you're making that. that well, that well, rewind this five minutes and, and, and watch it again. And, and I think you might right. see. Let's go on the I think one. that'll get me nowhere. Well, so I think there's, I think there's a, a the, the, there's a Christian tradition that understands uh, the Trinity in this way that the, the, the three persons of the tr Trinity are just a, a mystery. And then if we were to understand it, yeah, that would uh, diminish the awe and worthy of worshipness of God. I think that there are some people that the believe tradition, that, yeah. and yeah, I think that's the tradition in which Sai is is working in there. But I think Chris is coming from a divine hiddenness mm -hmm. sort of mm -hmm. um, route, in that a perfectly loving being would yeah. ensure that nothing that they did would put. Um, meaningful relationship out of reach. Yeah, and so want us to uh, J.L. Schellenberg has a um, really wonderful metaphor of this, is that um, God would be 
for everyone like a light that always remained on, no matter how much it might fluctuate in its brightness, it always remained on unless we were to cl close our eyes. I like Schellenberg. He actually, he actually uh, holds that atheism in order to be atheism requires the denial of God. So I like Schellenberg. All right. So anyways, um, all right, let's move on to the next one. Um, th this one is more of a, I don't know. Uh, this one has to do with, I guess, a, a um, extension of if the Christian God exists. And this has to do with salvation. It has to do with God uh, saving mankind and man going to heaven and living in perpetuity uh, in, in forever with God, right? Um, so my argument on this side was basically we are biological creatures. Most of the things that we have as far as who we are unfortunately are very biologically dependent, especially chemically dependent. We, we know for a fact that physical damage to the brain can change brain states. We know that hormonal levels can make us do stupid things and believe stupid things. And we all we all understand that we are very, very chemically dependent on that kind of stuff. Matter of fact, just the other night, I, w I was not feeling well again. Um, changes to our brain have changes to our mental lives. Yeah, and I, I dude, I woke up um, and I woke up in a panic because I thought, I didn't know what day it was. And I thought that I actually had to open at work rather than close. And I'm like, oh my, I, I, I usually stream on Fridays like today, but I have to stream on Tuesday, right? And I, I was I was in panic. I had convinced myself. I honestly believed that I didn't close. I had to open. I'm like, oh my God, I got to be up in a few hours. <laughs> my roommate's like, no, what the hell are you talking about? It's, it's not tomorrow. It's not Saturday. It's, it's Wednesday kind of stuff. Um, but, I, but my brain was thinking this, right? That is, but that is who I am, right? That was still me. I had that thought. It was a wrong thought, but it was based upon, you know, whatever process is going on in my head. So who are we going to be like in heaven as far as who we are now? I mean, what's the correlation there? Yeah, I have no, I have no idea what will be like there. However, I think you have to understand from my perspective, there's not one molecule in this earth outside of God's control. That's even your brain states. And the thing is, I've also heard the argument too, that if you take a sledgehammer to your television set, your television set might be damaged, but it doesn't mean it's not getting the signal anymore. So, you know, the signal is still there despite the damage that you might receive. However, the things that happen to your brain and your thoughts are according to you know my worldview is within total control of god so how that's going to look in heaven i have no idea you know i, I don't know how we'll be well, able to I remember mean, god theoretically you know, could control it doesn't mean he does i mean i don't think god sits there and manipulates every brain state and every you know process that happened regardless of whether thoughts or consciousness is emergent or it's non-reductive physicalism that gets into complexities of physical the, the yeah philosophy but that's of mind, not my world but, which is fine but but god is not sitting there tampering with people's brains right so when we exist in heaven, what is our brain state? Who are we going to be? I have no idea. But I, th I, I think a, a, a clear uh, to make the, the question a little clear, and I I understand that you know, Sai, you're probably not going to you know you're going to concede that you know this is just beyond your not this is a mystery in this life. Knowledge of something like that is a mystery. I think what Steve's getting at is. We have a personal identity through time, yeah. and that, that personal identity changes. There's psychological continuity, but that psychology changes over time. And so when we are in heaven, the question then becomes, and maybe we can't answer this question, but the question then becomes, at what part of our personal identity is in heaven and what part was destroyed here on earth and, and by the way this is not a gotcha question i wouldn't expect Cy to no. really have a great answer for it or anybody else atheist or otherwise because well, it's, it's a, a big it's a big question a in big both question philosophy of mind about, and yeah. it's philosophy, philosophy of religion, identity so. philosophy of identity yeah. what it means to even yeah. be identity so yeah, philosophy of mind and philosophy of religion it, it's there are big questions in questions. both yeah. you've you found one of those intersections it's a big question in philosophy that much ink has been spilled and will be mm -hmm. spilled. <laughs> yeah, no, I absolutely agree with that. And it is, I just know that question. Yeah. no eye has seen nor ear has heard what the, what the Lord has in store for those who love him. And I have no idea because there are definitely some mysteries there. Mm -hmm. You know, how can we be in a perfect state of peace, you know, when our loved ones are suffering? I don't know. But there, there's a, a chilling quote that I heard from a pastor who's writing to his children. And he said, do not, me, do not make me rejoice at your condemnation. That to me is inconceivable. That, but he trusted God so much that not only would justice be done, it would be seen to be done, that he would rejoice at the condemnation of his loved ones. Now, that is a, a wicked, bizarre thought to people who don't understand the goodness and the greatness of God. So I don't know how that will be the case in heaven, but I trust that it will be the That's case. That's fair enough. Look, I, I, I truly believe that 
not having an answer sometimes is the proper answer to give. Um, and I don't like to I don't like to chalk a lot of things up to, to divine mystery because a lot of people do that. But when you see in the Old Testament, uh, Samson was visited, Samson's uh, mother was visited by an angel and said, you're going to have a son. And then um, she talks to her husband, Manoah, and says, yeah, this angel visited me, says, I'm going to says, I'm going to have a son. And Manoah says, I want to talk to this angel, too. And the angel shows up and then uh, Manoah says, what's your name? And there's a translation that says you couldn't understand it. He says, my name is incredible. And that's the name of an angel. And we're trying to figure out, you know, how we're going to have these type of thouts in heaven. I have no idea. Kind of like Doctor but there Who, are you divine can't pronounce mystery. his real name. <laughs> the original <laughs> canonical Doctor Who is like, you wouldn't be able to say it kind of stuff. No, but there's uh, also in, uh, what's that uh, uh, spin off the uh, Simpsons cartoon? Um, that robot, I think he has a name. Too. There's a quote in there. I want to make a meme out of it too, that he could said it would take you a million lifetimes to pronounce it or something There's like actually, that. there's a book, I think, it was a story called- Futurama. Futurama, Futurama yeah, um, Bender. Um, yeah, <laughs> um, there's also a book by Robert A. Heinlein. Uh, it's called, I think it's called A Million Names of God. It's a very short story, mm -hmm. won a Hugo Award uh, that I read ages ago. And basically, they were trying to get a computer to put the name of God, to calculate the name of God. And when he would do that, it would usher in like the second coming and stuff like that. Very, very interesting story. Um, all right, so hey, let's move on. What's that? Wait, wait, one second. Did, did you see that the, the uh, um, I was watching one of the Avengers things and that, that guy, um, you know who's that really the smart guy? Vision. Vision. And they asked him what his name. He asked him what they asked him what his name was, and he just going, "I, I, I am." And I was with an unbelieving friend of mine. And I go, "Oh no, you got to be kidding me!" <laughs> but that did you remember that part of that movie? And uh, I, we ended up having a good, good theological. The, uh, the, yeah, I, yeah, I remember the scene story. that you're referring to. Yes. Yeah, we had a good theological discussion afterwards, but I thought I can't believe that they did that. <laughs> so many shows have really deep overtones, man. Like Rick and Morty has oh, yeah. a lot of theological oh, yeah. overtones. All right, uh, yeah. moving on. Uh, I'm going to skip this one. This one is like the existence of evil. That goes back to the moral monstrosities. There's a little, there was a little nuance between the two that I had originally, but it's okay. We're going to skip that one. Uh, seven. Now, I already know your answer to this one. Biblical inconsistencies and errors. Now, I think you argue that the Bible is infallible and inerrant, correct? Yes. Okay. But The original autograph. The original version. Now, do, do you hold that the versions we have today, whether it be the NIV or the uh, King James, do you, do you hold that they're inerrant? No, I'd say the original autograph. Clearly, there'll be tribe, uh, there'll be scribal errors and things like that. Okay, but, so you do accept, um, say, you do accept scribal errors. Yes. Okay, um, and that I, I respect that because there are some theists that don't even think they're scribal errors. Yet, correct me if I'm wrong. Well, the theologians in the room, like Floyd, uh, Second Peter has attribution issues. Correct. Uh, well, um, well. Uh, well, yeah, I mean, uh, critical scholars, you know, don't believe Peter wrote Second Peter, and and most don't believe Peter wrote First Peter either. Um, but um, but critical scholars, you know, believe that there's a lot of interpolations, uh, you know, within the different books uh, of the Bible. You know, they they say, for example, Paul only wrote seven out of the thirteen uh, letters that they are attributed to them, and even within those seven are interpolations. But you know, but I, I think it comes down to um, you know if, if we look at special revelation and then we can compare it to itself, you know, we see apparent contradictions. But also, if we if we uh, look at special revelation and then compare it to general re revelation or natural revelation, I think we see contradictions and inconsistencies there as well. So so th that would give us warrant to to doubt Christianity. And this is where you get into a debate over historical claims, uh, such as the Exodus, Noah's flood, uh, the Lucan census story, um, uh, the uh, Joshua conquests, and so forth. Um, you know, a lot of uh, you know scholars, you know, you know, doubt those things, and even even Catholic scholars, for example, uh, admit that the Lucan census story is is is, is uh, very problematic. Um, and I but, don't get yeah. any of that. So, I mean, like I said, I am so out of my depths when it comes to any kind of biblical stuff. I'm just, I would consider myself to be inept when it comes to the Bible. I take that. I'll take the hit for that. Um, it's just nothing that I really, I've read, you know, the Bible, both the New and Old Testament. And I, I get generally what's in there, but I'm not somebody who will ever sit and, and spend hours on end looking up scriptures or what the, the, um, the concordance Same. has. It's just not of interest that I have. Now, does it mean yeah. that people shouldn't have an interest in it? By all means, atheists. I know atheists that love reading the Bible and love um, diving into it. You know, great. It's just 
for me yeah. personally, it's not really an interest I have. Yeah, but I, I don't see how we can know that that the original autographs are are inerrant and so forth. I mean, we, we simply don't have access to it. And who knows, maybe later versions of those books uh, improved them. You know, what, what, maybe what, what they correct the evidence that the original first penmanship of these documents were the correct ones. The impossibility of the contrary, because if it wasn't, you couldn't have the basis for even examining them. That's that's circular, though. I don't. Well, I don't think his his. I don't think that his belief in that is based on you know the the inerrancy belief is not based on something of some evidential right. survey yeah, of no, historical I, I, no, text. No, materialism he, he precept. I understand it, he was correct from the externalist point of view, though. That would be basically saying, though, um, hey, look, we we know it to be true, therefore we know it to be true. But what Floyd's asking is, how would the externalist? Say, hey, look, how, how do we know that these original documentations was inerrant and infallible? Well, no, I, but, I believe but, because but, they are within size worldview, we shouldn't be leaving size worldview at all. We need to do an internal critique. Now, we could say, you know, Sai, you would say God's hand was on those autographs, right? On the original autographs, right? Right. Mm -hmm. But being a Calvinist, uh, God could have his hands in the later interpolations and 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 uh, and and scribal. Uh, you mean got a wrong beginning and then reproductions kind of as it well. Up. So why, 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 you know why why say that God was only part of the original and not part of would it be possible God the later God, copies God it, in order to get God's plan he gave he gave it originally and then perfected it over time. Right, right. Well, you know, God. God God has control over every molecule I mean, in the universe. Like and that would, that, and that, would to. that would include this, Impossible, the scribes right? making copies. Yeah, the argument for that would be then there be there could be perfect people as well now, and that's just not the way that God operates. Because then somebody yeah. could, could claim today that well, God has preserved me perfectly. I mean, just not the way He does it. Well, God I mean, has cre God, God has created Paul to write His letters right, and, and Paul's obviously not perfect, but 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 uh, right. Right, but the thing is, God can use in God can use fallible people to write infallible words. I mean, that there's not a problem. Right, there. and he can use infall he can use fallible people to to make copies of his infallible world as well. Right, right. So so, so it could how, be all part know, of his is, plan. What is, I mean, and and you know, why one over the other? Well, yeah. you know, I like what James White says about the the um, the the inscription of scripture is that. We know what is said, not because we have 95% and then we have to interpret the other 5%. He says, we know what's said because we have 110%. We have the, uh, the, the scribal uh, documents that we can uh, discern from the extra stuff to what was actually said in Scripture. And I don't have a problem with that. And even the scribal differences, you know, do not uh, deny the deity of Christ, for example. And if people want to go there, that's the kind of things that we talk about in Bible studies. And I'm saying when we go to Bible studies, we have a foundation of trusting that God has spoken his word. And it happened. So people get really mad when they say I have Bible studies with atheists because I do not hold the word of God up for an unbeliever to judge it, to put them over the word of God. But people who trust that God has spoken in his word, I have no problem discussing these supposed. Uh, no, that's um, consistent in your point. That's, that's consistent from your perspective. I, I, again, Floyd is right. Doing an eternal critique. I, I go by consistency. Well, we're, right. And we're I like talking about consistent. What? I was talking with uh, Chris early about the King James only movement. And I just remember a, a couple of years back that um, they found what they thought was an original copy of the King James Bible somewhere in England. And they had some scribal experts come and review it. And the way that they determined that it was an original King James Bible was because it had four errors in it. And I just thought that was very <laughs> ironic that, that that's how they determined it was an original King mm -hmm. James because of the errors. That's interesting, actually. Well, I mean, it, it kind of raises the question, though. I mean, if, if God wants somebody like myself to, uh, you know, believe in that classical theism type uh, God, the Bibles we have today clearly are not inerrant. They're not infallible. No, but the thing is, if God wanted you to believe, guess what, Steve? You would believe. <laughs> is that right? I mean, if God wanted me to believe that he, he has the ability to make people believe things. Exactly. And that's why I pray for you regularly. You you probably of the atheists, of the sorry, of the unbelievers that I know, I probably pray for you. And I, and I appreciate more, that. I more than other ones. I really do don't but, but, I don't I, I'm not offended when somebody says I pray for you. I don't I don't get offended. But people say that because God has not opened my eyes, therefore I'm not culpable. And then I, I of course I use the example of a hundred people conspiring to kill the governor's son. And they succeed and they murder him. And the governor comes to the prison and pardons one of them. And the others say, well, it's so unfair that God doesn't pardon me too. And if people don't understand their nature and God's nature, that he is within his uh, right to send me to hell. 
I say the difference between me and somebody that's going to hell is not that I'm better than them. It's because I'm better off. Well, yeah, but, you're, but you're Calvinist. You believe that you're elect, right? I mean, you believe that you're you're safe from the beginning. But yeah. Because of any I've done. Yeah. yeah, you won the lottery. And we yeah, you you right? won the lottery before pre-existence. You were this. You well, know, the thing is, you're still alive. Yeah, but I've been, I've been told the same thing because I'm Jewish that I've won the lottery and I'm automatically saved. So again, yeah. you know, hey, don't That's be knocking the Jews. <laughs> <laughs> I'm very proud of my Jewish heritage. Um, I know you want to do that. Uh, Chris, got a question? Go ahead. Yeah. So, um, so first of all, I want to apologize for getting a little heated there. Uh, there's see, there's certain whenever I read through the scriptures, and I've read through them quite a few times in my past, and when I think about those kinds of things. I think about what I feel are abusive situations that God is putting people in. But so aside from that though, so I would like to ask a question about Calvinism too. So it kind of, it's kind of has, it kind of does kind of go back to the, the, the problem of evil and everything. And so if God is in control, so God's in control of every molecule happening, you know, so on and so forth. And in, in that case, what, what are we to think of a God who, I guess, would you say causes evil? Like, let's say no, something, I wouldn't say something really horrific. It. No, he doesn't cause it. No. Okay. So what, how, so if he's, but he's in control of it, right? Right. Okay. So if he's in control of it, you know, what, like, what do you, what do you, what, what, how would you say that's, what do you mean? That's well, the thing is, now we have to uh, keep in mind too, that scripture says that these things are folly to people who don't believe. But the answer is that God uh, ordains my sin without sin. And the best way that I've found to explain, and all explanations have difficulties, don't get me wrong, but the best way that I explain it to people and that I think might be helpful to, to some, to Christians anyways, is imagine a murder mystery book and you're reading this book and the person in this book is about to commit a heinous crime. Does anybody reading that book think, oh, what's the author going to make him do now? No. He realizes that that person is 100% culpable for the sin, the murder that he commits within that book, even though the author wrote the book. Now, of course, all analogies fail at some point, but God wrote the book. God ordains my sin such that I'm 100% responsible for it, but he ordained it without sin. That way, when I sin, I can grieve at my wickedness. And trust me, you guys know I'm wicked. I can grieve at my wickedness, but I can thank God that he ordains all things for the good of those who love him, even my sin. And that's why when you read scripture and you see a, a, a horrific God, I adore him. And one of the things, the biggest issues that I had in my Christian walk was understanding that God loved me. And you know that my recent trials have more than anything else showed me that God loved me because he could have left me alone. He could have left me doing these talks, making, you know, the donations that I was making per month. He could have left me alone. He says, no, Cy, you are coming back to Canada for this purpose, for whatever. He could have done that. Now, what has happened with me, of course, granted much to my own doing, has been horrific. You know, not only with that, but with my own family. And I adore God for it. So when people read these things in Scripture and hate God for it, I'm sorry. That's not the God that I believe him. I love him. God, God well, works they, all they, things. They hate, for, I mean, a non-believer is not going to hate someone. God works all things for the good of those who love him. Now, I appreciate that Chris apologized for his rant against God, but I think it's very telling. And man, I, I it, it grieved me to watch your last show. And the, the thing that, Steve, I know that you're very sympathetic to Christians, but when, you, when Chris talked about his deconversion, you addressed him almost with glee. And you were thankful for your... Um, for your part in his deconversion. Well, no, not, not to de no, well, hang on, not to deconversion. I, you know, I'm against Young with Creationism. I mean, like when I debated Wayne Fillmore, he didn't, <laughs> I mean, he didn't stop being Christian, right? He's still a Christian, but he left Young with Creationism. That's my my bag, right? I I address a lot of things dealing with Young with Creationism. I have a lot of I have Dr. Ross coming on. I just had Dr. Hinky and Dr. Lachelle on. You know, that's something I I don't care whether somebody deconverts from Christianity. Right. It's really a non factor to me. I do, however, well, you know, I well, let me finish. I, I do, however. When somebody leaves a toxic religion, something that I think is a religion that's harmful, then yeah, I mean, so, like, I think just as an analogy, you both and I, you and I agree, if somebody leaves Scientology, it's a good thing, right? Okay, so yeah, well, it's, it, not. it's a kind of a given, right? Um, and so I don't really, I'm not there to deconvert anybody. And so, and by the way, I don't think I had really major effect on Chris's deconversion per se. Um, I think it was kind of a, along the same time period. Um, but yeah, I don't get glee out of people be, no longer being Christian. I get glee out of people no longer being younger creationists. So it doesn't put that on the table. <laughs> I, I, I think you probably know this already, but uh, I used to think younger Earth creationists were nuts. And now I thankfully consider myself in that camp. By the way, people ask me, am I a young Earth creationist? I say, no, the Earth is the oldest, oldest thing I know. <laughs> <laughs>
Well, well that, we're, we're, believe me, we have more on that t- topics coming up. Uh, on your but, but the thing is, yeah, I'm I'm a younger creationist, and I get you know this is folly to people who don't believe. I get that. Mm-hmm. Uh, I get it. But of course, you know, I have I very rarely even discuss this with Christians. But I was at a conference again with Eric Hoven, and we were talking about presuppositional apologetics. And this medical doctor came up to us afterwards and said, "You know, I was with you guys with this apologetic stuff, but when you got on the younger stuff, you guys are nuts." Yeah, well, I, mean, I, doctor, I, I fundamentally I said, believe 100% one percent. Right, Christian but well, I, but then I said to the guy, I said, um, "Well, do you believe that a dead man came back to life?" He says, "Yeah, of course, I'm a Christian." I said, "What in your medical practice shows you that men who are dead for three days can come back to life?" He said nothing. But one's, I said, but, why but, one, but one's a theological belief. The other one is see the problem. No, but the, oh, hang on, no, one second, one second. the problem you have though is your creationism isn't something that's taken on faith alone. It is purported to be science. Therefore, you can address it scientifically. The resurrection yeah, no, or that, coming back from the dead is not purported to be a scientific belief. It's purported to be a, a fact. But it yeah, it's but that's the difference. One can be addressed scientifically, shown to be incorrect. The other one is taken on a, a theological faith. It's not a taken on a no I don't know any Christian that says it's biologically possible to come back from the dead without God's help. That's 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 a difference there, you know. Right. Yeah. Well, I you know, I I, I see a, actually a similarity there. I, I say it's a matter of authority. He believed in the resurrection because his authority was scripture, but he didn't believe in the age of the earth because because we can scientifically de- that, but yeah, but we was, can scientifically was, demonstrate was not scripture. But but we can scientifically demonstrate young creation is false. That's well, the well, I know Hugh Ross has dealt with this, and I know it's not a young earth creation topic, but this yeah. is how I discuss it with Christians. I say, if there was a medical doctor, like even Hugh Ross believes that Adam was created as a man. Yeah, yeah. Hugh, Dr. And, Ross has got some yeah. beliefs I don't agree with, trust me. But I mean, like you, yeah, okay, but, I think he's a great guy. Ross is one of the most nicest guys I've ever met in my life, seriously. Right. Yeah. But this really is how I, I explain it to, to Christians. I say, let's say there was a medical doctor present one second after uh, Adam was created. And they said, examine this man, tell me how old he is. And he takes out his tape measure, measures his femur, measures how much bacteria has in his body, measures, you know. He says, this man is 17 years years old or 20 or 40, however old he was one second after. This man, he would have apparent evidence of age. How old was he? He was one second old. So what was he measuring? He was a measuring apparent yeah. age. So even if the dating methods we had age, today age were accurate. Age needs to be measured by. There's no question about that. And that, that's the right. whole even if they were accurate, hypothesis. How do we know that you're re- measuring apparent age over real age? And I say, well, I believe that God created the universe mature. And I know Hugh Ross's answer to that. He says, well, Adam wouldn't have scars. And well, also, you know, but uh, the thing is, even Jason Lyles believes that God wouldn't create the universe with with an age appearance of age to be deceptive. However, we're going to be talking about that. As the yeah, but, but but the thing is, Adam would create as a man would have been deceptive under that argument. But you're talking about Russell Humphreys, I believe, in one of your mm-hmm. other shows. And I actually sat in on one of his talks in Georgia a number of years ago, and it was pretty interesting. Yeah, it's, it's funny because Humphrey, Humphreys has corrected himself to me and other yeah, people in, I, in I private in emails, which is not even private because he made them public, but he's never gone back and corrected. Uh, you know, and we'll get into but, the whole uh, asynchronous light convention. Yeah, but I, I remember my friend on his website, the front page of the website, because he was at a talk as well, and the front page of his website said, science shows that young earth creationism is possible. And I, I contacted him. I chided him. I said, "What's your next title? What's your next thing going to be? Science shows that uh, virgin birth is possible." You know? <laughs> I, I get what you're saying. I mean, uh, go ahead, go ahead. What guys. is the way to go about it? So. In. Chris, go ahead. And by the way, okay, we got so, three more to go through, and then we got questions, so we'll have yeah, to expedite a little bit. Yeah, no, I'm going to make this quick. Um, I, don't, I did want to clarify uh, and make and make. I want to clarify something and, and then make a point. So. Uh, I want to clarify that what I was, I wasn't apologizing for my angry rant against, against God. God. Right, what I was, I was apologizing for the way in which I brought up those injections, uh, the injections. I'm sorry. I'm, I'm really tired. Um, objections. And so I should, uh, I think those are all legitimate objections. I think those are proper critiques of uh, internal critiques of, uh, of, of the Bible, uh, Bible stories rather. Um, but I also want to say that if I, I can understand, I understand that what's what's likely to happen is that the presuppositional community is going to see see that little bit there, and say, well, and like you just said, it's very telling and all that. I don't think it is. I think that I, I think, and we always and we do talk about how, you know, we don't hate something that that doesn't exist. And I know where people are coming from on that. But what I can do is when I when I look at uh, the Bible, I'm look at, well, I'm looking at what I consider to be a fiction. And so when I look at the characters involved, right, I can say, okay, that is an ugly character. I don't like that character. That's that's a nasty character. But I still believe that it's fictional. And so, um, for example, I don't like Draco Malfoy from Harry Potter. I think he is he was a horrible person along with his dad. That doesn't mean I believe they exist. Or how about, let's say, 
Orochimaru from the Naruto series. It's an anime. And uh, do I now believe that he exists? No, of course I don't. I just think he's a nasty character. I don't like him, but that doesn't mean that I think he exists. So anyway, that's, you, that's you I just wanted right. to clarify you're that. You're between disliking right. the concept vice and ontological object. That yeah, but I do believe like that they're all fiction. I don't think it's... Yeah. It's, it's, it's my question would be though how how many shows have you come on and ranted about them nobody argues well i haven't been invited to any <laughs> i mean yeah, like if i were invited to let's say an anime show right and we did start talking about the naruto series yeah I, I would rant against i would rant against orochimaru as a as a horrible character now he, later he turns good but that's not that's beside the point point. and so um uh, that that's that's I mean I could definitely do that. It's not a problem, but I, I haven't been invited to such things. I'll let you know when one comes up. Floyd, you got a question? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean I just you know again, yeah, the comparing characters here. If you if you look at the Calvinist God, um the reason why we uh, reason why we deny him is is because we were born this way. We were born with the total inability, total depravity to to uh not worship God. So you couldn't there's, even there's accept God. We can do to. in our own power to 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 worship it this would require god. god to to overcome that right it, yeah it re requires a, a god to intervene mm -hmm. and 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 change it so uh the westminster confession of faith makes it uh makes you know clear that 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 god by his decree foreordained and and unchangeably designed both the reprobate and the elect yeah, he picks and chooses from the, right. the difference and so anything we do in life doesn't make a difference anyways if you right. believe it but i think i think, no, I no, think no, no, inconsistency that's, with with calvinist theology is is they claim that god, that god is not the author of sin that god is not yeah, that's, the author of that's sin. fatalistic and calvinists aren't fatalistic for instance if i know that god is ordained that i have a full stomach then for me to say it doesn't matter if i eat or not is stupid well no but yeah but but as far as like hyper determinism where you de where you end up has already been determined has it not for everybody. Yeah, but God determines the means as well as the ends. I mean, it at least right, sounds but like God is the ultimate and first cause. We're just the secondary yeah, cause. Yeah, we're, we're not even a primary. Yeah, God is the primary right, cause right. and ultimate cause of everything. He's the remote cause. We're the proximate cause of, of right, let's, sin. Yeah. Let me get through these. Okay, so um, this one I call least degree of evidence, and this is pretty just a simple argument that if, if again, it, it, this wouldn't make sense to side because, again, he's not an evidentialist in this. So I would argue that if God wants somebody to believe, why would he use the most least degree of evidence, which is basically testimonial, secondhand, thirdhand, tertiary information. There's no direct evidence um, for God that we can at least go out and test for. There's nothing we can demonstrate. Obviously, science is excluded from that because uh, it does adhere to methodological naturalism or non-overlapping magisteria. But I think that it's weird from my point of view that God would make a system where your salvation is based upon a dosastic state that is predicated on having the least degree of evidence, the, the most minimal amount of evidence possible, the weak evidence, rather than having something that we can save for more of a certitude or more at least of a, of a stronger justification. Now, the precept doesn't have that problem. I will grant you that, right? The, you, you would probably agree that the precept doesn't have a problem with that because it's, it's presupposed rather than evidential. Yeah, but from my I, point of view, I, I that's would actually... what I would argue. Yeah, I think that um, if I wasn't a priest up, I'd see your point. <laughs> yeah, and again, I love this because the audience can actually see two vastly different perspectives. I, I, I hate to call them worldviews, but, but philosophical positions where there is, I, I obviously I hold there's no objective case to be had. It's just, you know, whatever you path you want to go, but they do both exist. And whether one accepts one or the other, his position is you know, isn't inconsistent. And that's one thing that I want people to understand. You can't go after a precepter about being inconsistent if they have a consistent worldview. It doesn't mean that they are correct. It just means that they are internally consistent. And so there are preceptors that don't have some consistency. I will admit that, obviously. Uh, Floyd, but we can account But yeah. we can account for correctness. <laughs> <laughs> uh, real quick, I got a super chat. Uh, uh, Pheasant, how you doing, buddy? $10. He says, Sai, did Tom Sawyer have any choice in tricking kids into painting the, the little wall, uh, the fence, um, after Twain wrote the book. If not, how do we have these choices when we're just characters in this book plan or slash plan that God has already made? So uh, did Tom Sawyer have any choice in tricking the kids to, to, to paint the fence white? Um, I haven't yeah, been that I, since I, high school, but I believe that's what it was, right? Well, I think that uh, free freedom is actually too broad a term because um, there's a difference. I would differentiate between free will and free choice. I would believe that we have free choice, but I believe that our wills are in bondage to our natures. And the way that I explain, it, I say, look, um, I don't have the nature of a bird. I'm not free to free to flap my arms and fly away, but I have the nature of a man. So I'm free to stand up and walk. 
But this is the, you know, this is where people will think I'm insane and, and they'll have problems with what I say, but God ordains my free choices such that they remain free. Now, the question is, how does he do that? You'll see it as a contradiction. I say, well, no, it's a divine mystery. I have no idea how he does that. But when people say it's a contradiction, of course, then I'll say, oh, you believe in logic. What's a, where do you get well, contradiction? Well, I don't necessarily disagree. I think we have will, but not free will. And I, I, I do think, I think the similar right. Our wills are in bondage yeah. to our nature. I, I think we, yeah. we come at it from a different perspective, but I think that we both conclude that, that same thing. So, so you would say you're a compatibilist, right? Yeah. I'm a compatibilist, right. yeah. So I, that's not why we have the same determine. position. Yeah. I, I have friends who are hard determinists, and and um, one guy in particular, I, I love him, and uh, he would say, man, Sai, it's so nice to see you again. You know, I love you, brother. I said, do you believe that, or did you have to say Yeah, <laughs> yeah well, especially if there's, fatalism would even be a higher degree of hard determinism. Um, I don't accept that. Yeah, but the thing is, there's no sense arguing truth if you're a hard determinist. Yeah, I Because then I, you're just I, saying what you're determined to say. There's no free choice at all in that. Right. And that's why I, I mean, I, I think yeah, soft I I think soft pedalism has issues as well, but out of, out of all of them, it's the least uh, egregious, I guess you can say. Um, yeah, I, but, but I, I, I would, I would sooner go that route than believe in um, libertarian. Yeah, free will. I can't accept libertarian free will at all. Yeah, I, well, I, I think that's, I think, I, I think that's still a big problem with with the Calvinist uh, theology that you know, uh, you know, divine determinism over you know. Uh, it does moral. seem deterministic, doesn't it? Oh, well, compatibilism is deterministic, right? Well, all, so, all, 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 we, all forms we do of what we will. are deterministic, right? We yeah. do what we They're will. We're, we're doing what we want to do. Right. You know, God's not forcing us to do anything but against I would what say we, it's hard we to... don't want to do, but he's but he's desiring our will. So we do what we will, but we don't but we're not determining our will. God is determining right. our will. But 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 I think you know Steve would agree with me too though as as an as an atheist. I'm not saying you're an atheist, but as an, as an atheist how are you free to do other than what your physiology determines that you do based on your, your chemical makeup? You know, I would say that without God, there's no such thing as free choice. That you're determined to do what your physiology makes you do. How do you well, free choice without God? Well, so I guess, uh, well, first of all, I don't, I have no idea. <laughs> uh, when it comes to uh, determinism versus, um, you know, free will and all these things, I have, it's not something I've studied, so I honestly don't know. And I mean, I would be okay if everything was deterministic. I don't, it wouldn't really matter to me, but, um, so I'd love what, it. what I, I, I've been wanting to kind of say this. So we're on, we're talking about the least degree of evidence. So, uh, I guess I'm just kind of making a statement. It's not necessarily a, you know, I'm going to come and get side kind of thing, but it's more of like, so yeah. So since we're on this topic, yeah, I would say that my atheism stems from while I was deconverting feeling, uh, noticing that, um, well, first of all, I learned about Occam's razor. So I'm a big Occam, Occam razor fan. Right. And so, um, that's one thing. So then I started noticing that, uh, natural, um, explanations were better explanations in that they didn't have to pause it unnecessary things. Like, so naturalism is more uh, simple and it's also sufficiently explanatory. And I think that uh, once you have those, those two things, um, and again, you apply Occam's razor, God just kind of becomes an arbitrary assumption. And, we, and it's, and it's something that, that, that we that we can do without. Grandma Oppie would, by the way, would agree with you. No, I know because I learned it from him. Yeah, that's, 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 that sounds very obvious. To me. <laughs> yeah, no I'm, doubt, dude. I'm getting back to Oppie, so I know Oppie's work. Cause like that's awfully, awfully Oppie-ish. Uh, I know Ben's so that would be that, 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 that too. My answer yes. to that Occam's Razor says you cannot posit more um, explanations that are necessary, yeah, but you, you also can't posit less. Your, your, yeah. I mean, there's something I'd like to ask uh, Steve, though, just you know, from his understanding, from my position. Of course, First John two nineteen says those who left us were never among us. However. So, I mean, just totally curious, uh, curious what you think about it, because as a Christian, I say that God is the ultimate authority of my reasoning. If you guys were, for instance, to present something tonight that gave me pause, that I didn't understand, Scripture says I'm supposed to not lean on my own understanding, all my ways acknowledge Him, and He will make my path straight. So even if there were things I couldn't understand, and there are things in the Scriptures I can't understand, mm -hmm. or even if someone were to bring something to me, I would rest, neat, lean on my, not on my own understanding, and I would trust God for that. So I'm saying that once a person leans on their understanding and tries to come to a, a rational conclusion which denies God, it shows that God is not the foundation of the reasoning. And I think that's just a logical uh, avenue. So I know the Bible says it, those who left us were never among us. But logically, I'm wondering if you can see my position that logically one cannot reason out of a position that God is the ultimate authority of the reason.
I mean, it's it's internally consistent from your point of view. I, I wouldn't say it's a logical issue. No, that's fair. Uh, but, okay, but internally, internally consistent. consistent. Sure. Um, yeah. yeah, and that's why. Then that's one of the reasons why I do respect you, you know you as you coming on to talk about these things is because I look for inconsistencies and I, and I find you to be very consistent. It doesn't mean I agree, but I like the fact that you generally are consistent. Um, you know what I'm saying, Steve? I look for inconsistencies too. Uh, but let me ask you this: so when it comes to like you know the knowledge stuff. Um, that's fine when it talks about God himself. Let's talk from your perspective, from an eternal point of view, um, that if God, you know, presuppose exists and everything of that nature, it still doesn't follow, even in your point, your worldview, that younger creationism is true. It doesn't follow. So if something gives you pause in younger creationism, you could, are you just going to fall back and say, hey, look, you know, I have to trust God in this, or can you actually say to yourself, you know what? Everything about God is correct, but my understanding of science is wrong. Therefore, maybe I need to update it because, you know, as well as I do, a lot of people have left young earth creationism and now are very happy old earth creationists that are still Christians. It, a lot well, of them. Well, let me put it this way. Uh, even as a, when I was an old earth creationist, I did believe that the clearest interpretation of Scripture was that the earth was not old, mm -hmm. as they would see it. And I think even there are older Christians who say the same thing. So that when I stand before my maker, I will be, um, you know, I will feel better to explain, to, to sure, say no, that this, no, no, I, this is my best sure. understanding sure, of what sure. the Bible says. Yeah, and and I, now there, I get there are wonderful websites that go to explain young earth creationism. But the thing is, I get that people will think that's absurd without God. Yeah, I mean, no, that's I, exactly I, I, what I, I get it. Is. Okay, so so yeah. so you could justify, let's say, let's say that young earth creationism, hypothetically, because this is possible in a possible world, it could be wrong. That's a fact. It could be. It could be wrong. I believe that very strongly. It is wrong, um, but it is it's possible. It's a hypothetical that does exist modally. So, if that's the case, um, you could go to God and say, "Look, man, this is. You know, I believed it was young. I got it wrong. I or God believed it was old. I got it wrong. I don't think God would care one way or another. That's just why I don't think it's salvational. I don't. But you know, people like Hoven, he makes it salvational. I know you're not, you know, big fan. Yeah. Of, with with Kent himself. <laughs> Um, I'm a good friend. I'm a good friend with his son. I, I know. Of course, and, and Eric's, you know, I think Eric's his been father cordial. doesn't like me. Yeah. Yeah. yeah I, I don't cordial. think his father uh, uh, cares uh, too much for me. But I, I would say that um, it is so clear in Scripture that I would, uh, people who would deny it, I, would, I wouldn't say they're not believers because I was in that camp. Mm -hmm. You know, I used to think younger creationists were nuts. But you don't just but agree I with science tends, sci there is evidence science is it, it, you may not have to agree with it, but you can't say there's no evidence against young creation. Well, as, as a presupposition, I mean, we all have biases, so yeah. I will interpret those things with which comport with my presupposition. And I even use this in my talks. I say, if you put a fossil between a believing geologist and unbelieving geologist, the believing geologist is going to say thousands of years, mm -hmm. and the unbelieving geologist is going to say, oh, a million of years. But there is an objective might have, matter might, to be had. But there might be PhDs in both their fields, but they approach it. Well, you've heard of that uh, that fellow who uh, found, and I think the guy, I, you know, I don't agree with his theology either, but they found dinosaur bone soft tissue. And they called the paleontologist, the head of the team who uh, who had found this, and they had raised over $20,000 to have it carbon dated. And this guy refused to carbon date the dinosaur because bone soft tissue. carbon dating doesn't work for that kind of stuff the millions of years. doesn't work on something that old, yeah. is what he said. Well, yeah, and, and I'm familiar <laughs> with that. I mean, I've had Dr. Mary Schweitzer on this channel, and you know I've worked right. with Dr. Fuzz Rana, who wrote a book called Dinosaur Blood in the Age of the Earth, which he sent me a copy to review, actually. He's, and, and I did so, and I thought it was a great book, actually. And so I'm well but familiar you understand with, the, the... with that particular you know topic, but the problem is, is right. that... The younger the creation, even even the Mary Schweitzer has said the younger creation has got it wrong. She's like, look, I'm a Christian. She, you know, she she she's like, this is the science. There is there these objects are around 64 million five 65 million years old, um, and the, everything they put out against her has been refuted ad nauseum as far as the the right. soft tissue. I mean, it's just it's just a dead issue. Are, are there any anymore. are there any non Christian young Earth creationists? None that I'm aware. I, I don't of. know, but the thing is, I, I think that you would agree. Steve, oh, that's that an both, interesting fact. Yeah, it's, it's we, a we bias. both we but both wait, have rec hold on. we both have rescuing devices that aren't Christian. We, well, like Muslims, I'm sure they're younger creationists. Or I guess maybe uh, I'm yeah, misunderstanding. Judo, Judo Christian, yeah, Judo, uh, Judaic Christian. Yeah, but I, I, actually, are. I actually know of people who believed in the resurrection of Christ who weren't Christians. Mm -hmm. Well, I don't. I, well, I mean, again, I there's, there's, there are Christian atheists, but Christian atheists is somebody who believes that Christ <laughs> has great philosophies, but not was of divine. No, but I actually know well, one well, person personally who thinks who, Christ who was, was resurrected, but 
is not Christian. Who first believed that Christ raised from the dead, and he wasn't a believer yet. And I know one a, a story of one woman who believed the resurrection and said strange things happen in this world. Someday well, you know, that that makes, well, look, you could believe that Christ rose from the dead and not want to worship him, right? And not be right. Christian. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Well, that, that would be the case, I think, with a yeah. lot of people. All right. So let's look at these last two real quick. Um, number, number nine, fantastic stories. Um, one of the things that, that um, uh, will, will be argued, uh, that I've argued often, and same with, with um, uh, a couple other people in the philosophical communities, is that a lot of these stories we hear from the Bible are very reminiscent of fantastic stories, like mythological stories, right? Um, we know man has the, the ability to create explanations for things if he doesn't understand something. The mind wants to. Right. And so when we hear a, a story of like Superman or Spider-Man, uh, we are told properties that Spider-Man and Superman has. So Superman can fly, Spider-Man can climb walls. So when we hear these these things about the Christian God, they seem very reminiscent of what man would would attribute to a supernatural being rather than what a supernatural being would actually be. That, that So when I say fantastic stories, um, there's this there's this naturalistic point of view that look what is more likely that god the gods were created including the monotheistic christian god was created by man in order to explain something to have an accounting rather than um being the actual ontological fact that he does exist yeah well uh, let, let, let me just put it this way Ozzie makes I, this I argument too by the way i i can't tell you one unbeliever that i've explained the gospel to and they say yeah that makes a lot of sense <laughs> well, 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 same thing to explain younger creationism to an old earth one. No, no, like, that, that doesn't make a lot of sense. But, but that's my point, yeah. that I don't think anybody would make up a story like that. Really? We, people, you know, well, just, people made up Zeus and, and Greek gods and Roman gods and all kinds of pantheonic gods. Yeah, but the I don't thing know, is, I, I mean, I, we have fictional stories that make up all kinds of things that, you know, would even be on that level you know so i just i don't People know believe in bigfoot okay i mean even though that's been disproven many times over but scripture even says that this is folly to those who are perishing so i i don't expect it not to be folly and i think that christians when they're surprised that people think it's folly i think well, but you do agree it does, sounds fantastic right these stories do sound fantastical of okay yeah it's amazing it's a, yeah it's but you would argue that because they're fantastic and they happened makes it all the more evidence even though you're not evidence well, I, no i wouldn't make that argument oh, okay. because you know i i mean because that would be an evidential argument. Right, it would be an evidential <laughs> I almost got you. <laughs> uh, I do like you, Steve. Uh, I likewise, like man. You. I, you're funny. Dude. People don't recognize, a lot of people don't understand, you have one hell of a sense of humor, man. You have, you're have. you funny, man. <laughs> well, I love to be a comedian, but everybody laughed. How oh, people take things so seriously. All right, number 10. Hey, come on, that was a joke. No, 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 no. I, I know. I, well, you, you're that, that, there's I a story about a guy. Yeah. What's that? And there's a story about a, a comedian and he was in front of this crowd and he says, you know, when I was a, a kid, I was saying, I want to be a comedian. And everybody laughed. He said, they're not laughing now. <laughs> <laughs> Go ahead, boy. <laughs> yeah, just, just real quick. I mean, you know, we see these fantastic stories in other myths, other religions, and we don't believe them. So, again, why should we believe it? Why should we believe these Christian stories? Mm -hmm. Yeah, know? especially the flood. Yeah, only, one, only one reason. With each other. Each other. Only one reason. Because it's true. <laughs> yeah, it says, uh, I mean, says the people of the other religions. Yeah, well. I mean, because again, you, you, the, 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 the older creationists will say the exact same thing. The scientists will say the flood never happened. Um, and, you know, but, but again, we, we're going to, well, the other episodes are for non for young creationism, but, um, you know, at least, at least we all agree that they do sound fantastical. Okay, number 10, scientific literacy. Um, look, I'm not a scientist, uh, and I certainly don't subscribe to scientism, although I really do respect science. I, I've been educated in scientific fields. Um, I got a background in nuclear reactors. People know I've been, I was trained to operate nuclear power plants and, and train people to operate them. So I do appreciate science. Um, but scientism, I think, is a, is a wrong approach to epistemology. I do think there's many other ways to acquire knowledge other than science. But we do know things now we didn't know 2,000 years ago. And I think that if, a, you know, if those people that lived 2,000 years ago were brought forward to now, maybe they wouldn't even have remotely the same perceptions and, and ideas they had back then. So we can explain things now that they weren't able to explain back then. And yeah, Dar Darwin wouldn't be a Darwinist today. <laughs> well, yeah, I'm not a Darwinist. I, our Darwinism. No, but Darwin wouldn't be a Darwinist. Right. Yeah, of course. Well, Darwinism is outdated. It's, that's 19th, 20th century stuff. <laughs> um, we have the modern evolutionary synthesis with a lot of people kind of conflate to Darwinism. But actually, Darwinism is, is something different than modern evolutionary synthesis. I have a biologist on the 20. Sometime next week, I have a biologist coming on, by the way, PhD in biology. But anyways, you know, so so would you agree, though, as we seem to, to be able to, to understand reality more, 
um, the need to have a God is less? As an explanation? No, I, I, no, I, I would say that the more we find out about the earth, the more in awe we are of God. But of course, as a presupposition, I would say that all of science is built on the scientific principle, induction. And that's one thing that you just blindly, that's one of the things you put yeah, blind no, faith I, and, I, and I accept that. You're absolutely right. Um, and I and I absolutely will admit, I bite the bullet on that. I think that induction is non-justifiable. I mean, I know uh, David would ar just argue, you know, he would argue otherwise. He, he thinks that there are some evidential reasons to accept induction um, from an evidence point of view. Uh, I haven't read those works yet. I, I, I read a little bit of McGraw, uh, Tim McGraw, um, or McGrew, I'm sorry, but um, I haven't really been convinced that the problem of induction has been resolved. However, you know, even, even, even it has or has not, I still recognize there was a problem there. I mean, the human problem induction is a circular problem to justify, but I don't posit something ad hoc in order to try to have a metaphysical accounting for induction. But absolutely, science is inductive in nature. Uh, this is an argument that I've had with even atheists. They think that science is deductive. No, science is not deductive. Um, matter of fact, deduction doesn't give you any new information. It just tells you how to rearrange information you already know. But that's not what science does. Science wants to explain things by new theories, which is inductive. Just to share some from a, a Christian perspective, there's a story of Greg Bonson that I, that I really liked. And um, he said he would have students come into his classroom and they'd say to him nervously, I can't believe that I'm being instructed by the great Dr. Bonson. And he would kind of slough it off. He says, but then a month into it, you know, he, they think, well, maybe they're not quite in agreement with that thing that he's saying. He says then a, a year into their semester, they're actually actively arguing against what he believes. And now he's not so great anymore because they know more about him. But he says the thing about God is that the more we know about him, the more in awe we are of him. And that's why I cannot believe that there are microbiologists on this earth who, who deny the existence of God. And I think the more that we see about the intricacies of the universe, you know, the more in awe we are. And, I, and there's issues with the Abraham Lincoln quote, but he said, I can understand how people can look at the world and say there is no God. But I cannot understand how people can look at the heavens and say the same thing. And I would say the same thing. The more that we discover about this universe, the more in awe we should be of it. No, oh, I have nothing against being in awe. I, look, I, I could take it as even a spiritual approach. I think that there is some spiritualism involved when we look at the the complexities and the beauty of, 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 of reality. I have no issue with that. Um, as a matter of fact, I'm a huge advocate of that. That doesn't mean anything supernatural, by the way. It just means I, I went to an atheist meetup uh, once. I went to an atheist meetup once, and uh, it was interesting in, in the town uh, where I live there. And the whole topic, they had a guy from the university, and um, he said the problem with atheists is that they need to be more thankful. And, of course, he didn't expect that there'd be a Christian in the audience, so I stuck up my hand and I said, uh, who do you thank? And he <laughs> he paused, he walked, he paced back and forth for a little while, and then he turned to me and says, I guess we thank our lucky stars. <laughs> and I thought, man, there were there was a woman in there with a you know her head wrapped because she had chemo, she'd lost her hair and stuff like that. I thought, man, what hope is there there in that? I, just, I felt really bad for her. Well, let's uh, let's see if the live chat have any questions. I just put in the live chat there if there are any questions. Super chats are welcome, by the way, but not necessary by any stretch of imagination. However, got to fund the show somehow. Got to keep the lights on. Um, but by all means, you don't have to, to donate. The fact that you guys even show up, I'm just still blown away that we still have such a following that we do. Um, so if you got questions, ask them now. Um, I'm going to be wrapping this up. Um, Chris, you want anything to, to add? And by the way, um, to all cards on the table, Chris, as you as you know, because if you know it was a conversion, you know thought probably very much like you did even as much as like a year or two ago he sent me some videos where we're pretty telling of him doing some processing right. on the street the thing is, man i would have walked by him guy like dude this dude is whacked out of his mind man <laughs> i i believe that christianity yeah, makes the most sense but i'm i believe christianity makes the most sense but i'm not a christian because it makes the most sense no that's i'm a christian because god took out my heart of stone and gave me a heart of flesh and i and i, and I love him you know, I mean, especially with the trials that I've been through uh, recently, I mean, it's only uh, increased my my um, love for him and, and increased my faith. And yeah, yeah, so, and, and um, I, got no, I, I, I got no disrespect for Christians that honestly believe that I really don't. I, I It really bothers me. I had somebody not too long ago, a couple months ago, was saying that I had because I had a friend on Nikki and her and I were talking about chick tracks and, and we we're talking about a very specific one that I thought was very morally egregious. We weren't condemning <laughs> Christians. We were condemning the chick track. We we're condemning this this. Yeah. It's just completely morally egregious um, comic strip, but it had nothing to do with condemning religion. 
or even Christianity specifically. And yet I, these pe some people were saying, oh, well, Steve was bashing on Christians. Nobody's ever heard me do this. I don't bash on Christians. I, I, I attack young earth creationists as far as the science. I will, I will definitely make fun of flurfers because um, I'm sorry, I will bash on flurfers. But I mean, I've never bashed on Christians in my 10 years of YouTube. And so I asked them for evidence of this. And of course, they provided none. Um, and but maybe they just presuppose that I did. <laughs> they don't need evidentialism. They just presuppose Steve bashed on Christians. Therefore, it must be true. No. So here's a question for you, though, because I clearly I'm a young earth creationist and I believe you you know, basically what I believe. What do you believe is toxic about my Christianity? Um, I mean, the only thing I could say is it's not so much the Christianity, because in your point of view as a Calvinist with a, a, some sense of high determinism, you know, whether you're elect or probate, we really have no control over. So therefore, you know, it seems like a moot issue to me as far as salvational, uh, anything like that. But as far as like the science, you also know my position. I'm a strong advocate for solid science. And when I see young creationists make very fundamental blunders in their science and their mathematics that are just objectively wrong, you could say the science may not be objective, but math is objective. And you may not have looked into it, but Dr. Ross has, Dr. Uh, Lachelle has, and Dr. Hinky has, and I can tell you right now, Humphreys has made math mistakes. He, he has admitted to making math. No, that's mistakes. that's fair. Right. That that's but, fair. But he and people correct say them. That. He will correct them. That to me is toxic. Right. Well, that that's a problem. If that's what you rest yourself on, because I've said I've heard people say that he uses incorrect models as well. Yeah. Yeah. However. He did. However, of course, I mean, you disagree with the way that I look at it, but somebody could have that same uh, conversation about uh, virgin birth. Yeah, but, but, here's the thing, though, but, but here's the thing, though. These, that's not being purported as a science. And what's worse is that... Um, no, but it's being purported as a fact. Okay, but, but, but still, at least scientific inquiry can be, be something we, we look at and, and we say, okay, this is the subject, this is the, um, the claim being made. This is the scientific claim being made. Can we objectively evaluate this? And certain claims we can. Humphreys is objectively wrong scientifically and mathematically, especially which because it's math. But as far as like the toxicity, there are a lot of people that don't recognize that he made some math errors that still will argue his arguments. And then when you say, look, he, he, he was wrong, they don't have the skill set to really determine why they were wrong. That right. to me is toxic because, because here's the right. thing. To certain young earth creationists, they cannot be wrong. They, they, you know, these sign a statement of faith saying that look, any evidence that goes against young earth creationism must be wrong by fiat. That's right. not how you do science, well, and I think that's. I see science. what you're saying. That's I toxic. see what you're saying. I see what you're saying. I think that's fair as well, and that's why I'm not an evidentialist. I mean, that's not why, but I think that's one of the problems with it, because let's say that somebody studies uh, carbon dating. And they become an expert in carbon dating. And then somebody wants to argue carbon dating for the age of the earth. And then you say, ha, carbon dating can only measure things within thousands of years. Mm -hmm. And then the PhD steps over their shoulder. Yeah, we're not talking about carbon dating. We're talking about radio, radiometric dating. There's different isotopes. In it. Now you're into that conversation again. And the first guy probably made a stupid mistake. Will he admit to it? No. Yeah. Because the Bible it's says not easy subject. See, see, another thing that I've noticed with the Young Earth Creationist movement is that you talk about very complicated subjects and try to explain them to a lay person. Um, and they do rely on the fact that the lay person is not going to probably have the, the foundational um, understandings to really right. dissect the, the argument. And, and, and sometimes, and I hate to say it, but I do believe like some of them, like Dr. Nathaniel Jensen, who has been on this show, I personally believe, because he said it, that the ends justify the means. He, he could take his Harvard education yeah. and lie to people because to him, he thinks that because if it brings people to Christ and they're saved, the end justifies the means. Now, you yeah. don't have the problem as a priest supper. No, that's horrible. And because yeah. the thing is, not only that, is that a uh, um, an honest atheist to the degree that they can be will hang their hat on the stupid mistakes of Christians. They'll use that as an excuse yeah, not to I believe because not the guy won't I, admit I think it's counterproductive. Mistake. Yeah, I think it's counterproductive. By the yeah, way, I, I have the same for atheists. If atheists use bad arguments to deconvert a theist, they're just as bad. I mean, it, got, it, it cuts both ways. I'm, I'm equal opportunity when I when I see people making very fundamental mistakes. Um, and again, these are not something that are just subjective. These are objective things. You can go look at his math and see that it's wrong. Um, and, you know, I don't think Humphreys cares because he's like, he's got to be in his 80s. Um, he probably doesn't care anymore. And I don't. Well, I part don't. of the problem is, too, when, when they when uh, I'm not saying him because I don't know, but people like him have a table full of books in the lobby when they go speak somewhere. Yeah. You know, I, I don't do that. If I speak somewhere, I say, read your Bible. I, I have noticed, yeah. by the way, that and you cannot tell, read your Bible. The the yeah, ex, the experts, the PhD creationist, um, 
they have a lucrative contract with things like Answers in Genesis and ICR and Creation Research International and Creation Research Ministries. There's a lucrative factor to be had there. There is no question about it. There is monetary incentive. We all know this, okay? Um, <laughs> and I think, again, that it, that excludes them from having any kind of objective uh, evaluation. And by the way, atheists, same thing. They have, you know, they put out books. Yeah, that I think you know much crap. about the... Do you know much about Jason Lyle at all? At all? Yeah, yeah. Matter of fact, uh, I have Dr. Russ coming on. We're going to talk about Dr. R Lyle's um, asynchronous uh, convention, asynchronous like convention. Um, Interesting. And it's so funny is is that Lyle isn't really incorrect. I, I mean, you know, have you asked him to come on at all? Or, um... I don't. I don't think. I, I, maybe. Maybe like a eight. I don't know. Four years ago, maybe. I mean, he has engaged. I, he has engaged Dr. Ross before. Well, and, and they 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 did a written. Oh, okay. They did a written. Um, okay. I I. I I don't think I've reached out to Lyle in, in some time if I ever did. I, I vaguely recall that I thought I might have. Um, maybe one day, but I mean, I, I, I asked Safadi the other day. I got along with Sir Dr. Jonathan Safadi for years. Um, we don't see agree on a lot of things, but I've known him for like eight years. Um, and I asked him, come on, but he can't. He says, you know, he'd, he'd like to, but he just can't. And I think it's because they can't go on to certain shows that's not controlled by Answers in Genesis or ICR. That's I mean, I, 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 that's, yeah, that's sad. It's really. true. It's, it's absolutely true. I've had actually one or two, and he hasn't admitted to me that, but I've had other people admitted. They're like, oh, my, um, what, what is it? The, the body, the, the governing body. I don't know what you call it. Yeah. Um, no, I, I get it. I get it. We I can't, just, we can't like, do it. And so I've been told like that it, before. Yeah. yeah. It's, it's unfortunate. Um, because I'd love to get more younger creationists on here. I really would that are of the upper echelon, but they're very hard to come by. I've had McNulty, McNulty on here. Um, but if you know, McGurdy, uh, McMurty, um, and that, that guy is way off base. He's got so many things wrong. McMurty. If I could point to people that argued consistently with scripture, then I, I wouldn't do this. Yeah. You know, because I, I'm a boiler operator by trade and sure you guys are way smarter than me. I, you know, I, you guys run circles around me with certain things. The reason I'm on here is because I don't see people talking consistently with scripture. It makes me sick. Well, and, I, and like I said, I, you know, I appreciate the fact that you actually said you believe what you believe and you're willing to defend it and talk about it. What more can somebody ask? I mean, mm -hmm. I've, I've never considered you dishonest when it came to that. Um, again, I think there's some issues when it comes to the sciences and stuff like that. But at least I've, I've always felt that you will promote things to the best of your ability. Do I think you use rhetoric? Yeah, you're a rhetorician uh, in some degree. <laughs> Um, but whatever. I mean, I don't, I don't think it offensively that you use some kind of form of rhetoric. Um, but I've never seen you go actively go lie to people or be disingenuous of your beliefs. And I think that's an important distinction to be made. Yeah. Floyd. And then we'll wrap it up. Yeah. I mean, in regards to science, I, I really don't see how the presupposition of this ex explanation for the uniformity of nature is, uh, is any more superior than a, a naturalistic explanation. I mean, a, a presuppositionist will say that, um, Nature is uniform because God created that way. God is invariant. He doesn't change. And, and he's the principle for why uh, the universe has its invariant laws. Um, so what to basically that's, what a, that's incorrect, by the way, that's incorrect. But we could talk about well, that. Later. Well, 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 how would you phrase it? Well, I think people make that mistake because God has created that way, but it's not a reflection of his nature. Logic and morality are. But it says that these time these things will continue as long as the earth endures. I don't believe the second law of thermodynamics is going to take is going to be the case in the new heavens and the new earth. Things are not going to proceed to the level of decay. So people make the mistake of saying that nature is such such a way because of God's character and nature. No, I believe that the laws of nature will change in the new heavens and new earth. Well, they wouldn't be applicable. It wouldn't be a natural world. But, but, God, but God's you responsible. Know, God made, made, made the universe... Uh, Right, uh, right. Uniform, that, uh, right. He so made it that yeah, way. He he could have yeah, made right. it some. He could have made it some other way, but he he decided to make it uniform, mm -hmm. right? So well, so, I, I don't think he could make it another way in order for us to be able to have dominion in it. I think that he had to make it this way so that we could uh, know things. Because yeah, if it I mean, wasn't it wouldn't uniform, be, it wouldn't be in, it wouldn't be intelligible if if uh, if, if right. Well, that if goes to the whole anthropic uniform. principle um, to some degree. Uh, well, well, not so much anthropic principle, but this is. I mean, this is the standard criticism of the teleological argument. So we have a mechanistic understanding of the natural world um, by science that makes predictions that mm -hmm. we can confirm and we can disconfirm. But then when we say that God created, you know, the vertebra eye to be this way rather than that way, we don't actually know that. Um, divine psychology, like we, we don't actually know what a God would want. So the, uh, Elliot Sober makes this point really well. Um, you know, let's imagine that we're cooking in a kitchen 
and someone brings us an order for oatmeal and you look out and you see Billy and Sally in the restaurant and you go, hmm, who ordered this oatmeal? We well, don't actually know who ordered it. The, the observation doesn't discriminate you between the hypothesis unless you know facts about Billy or Sally. Now, if you know on an independent grounds that Billy doesn't like oatmeal or Sally has a gluten allergy, these are ways in which now the hypothesis can make predictions on what you're supposed that, to observe. Is, is that based on priors? No, not prior. So uh, yeah, it's, it's, yeah, it's priors. It's prior information. So, you know, you, you know information that's tangentially related. Well, so it's not prior. It's it's independent evidence that then. So this is what's called Duheim's thesis. So Duheim's thesis says that look, our our hypotheses don't actually predict anything unless we make assumptions about them. So like, you know, Newton's theory of motion sure. doesn't make any predictions unless we assume that there's matter in some oh, arrangement yeah. Yeah. The, like we have to make every, assumptions. every theory has its own set of assumptions well, so with and, intentional yeah so with intentional explanations we have to make appeal to some sort of motives we have to appeal to beliefs we have to so in the case of design arguments we have to appeal to a divine psychology we don't actually have any independent way of understanding what that divine psychology is so we don't actually know what predictions a design hypothesis is going to make. And this is just one of the standard criticism. I mean, this is kind of the standing objection um, in, to the ty these types of teleological arguments. They were first put forward by Hume in the dialogues concerning natural religion, but it was really Darwin. Like when Darwin came in, that was kind of the, because that gave the, because it was, you know, is this design or is this chance? Yeah, he gave a, he gave well, a Darwin, teleonomic explanation. Yeah, over well, D Darwin was like, look, it's not chance. It's, um uh their chance processes mm -hmm. that 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 happen here there's principles that are um a mindless chance process and they make predictions and so that's what we're able to pr make predictions about the fossil record we're able to make predictions about biogeography we're able to make predictions about genetics or morphology all these different lines of evidence all line up because these hypotheses are able to make predictions in a way that the design hypothesis just really can't because we're just cut off from the divine psychology. Yeah, and that's something that we're going to be bringing up too. I could, you brought that up because there's a question asked on the very thing about random processes and natural selection and how there are um, randomness and chaos in biological uh, theories. Yeah, but, yeah you know, mutation, but, mutation but, is random, but natural selection correct. is not. Yeah, it's not random. random. It's not directed, but it's not random. And a lot of people conflate these terms randomness when they because the, the, randomness has different usages. Um, and again, just because something's stochastic doesn't mean it's purely random. It just means that we don't have the information to determine what the outcome is going to be. So, um, you know, I don't think there's any biologist that thinks that DNA arose by some random chance, which is a common argument that I see creationists use is like, oh, like DNA rose by randomness. I don't know anybody who argues this. Because again, just well, because the well, that was the argument. I mean, that was the argument prior to Darwin. So right, like right, that exactly. was but Darwin's right, argument. The right, intuitive exactly. force of that comes in of <laughs> you know, the hypotheses are that an intentional agent designed something right. for a purpose or that something just popped into but existence. We, we did Darwin show we didn't need a telos for it. I, real quick, we do have a question for the, the atheist, and then we'll get moving here. I know Chris had one thing he wanted to say, um, but here's a question from um, Antonio. He says, my question for atheist, so Floyd and Chris. Um, Anthony. Oh, Anthony. Um, I like, okay, Anthony. Sorry, you're right, Anthony. Um, if knowledge can originate from us, since what is real cannot originate from us, then it follows that knowledge must transcend us right. I'm, I'm going to read that again. If knowledge can't originate from us, and again, I think he's talking about metaphysical accounting, um, since what is real cannot originate from us, I disagree, um, then it flows that knowledge must transcend us, right? I'm not sure I fully understand the question, but I'm, 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 if you guys can't I'm going to be honest it. with you. That, I'm, I'm just going to be straight up. It sounds like nonsense. Yeah, I, I, I don't understand. I can't parse it very yeah. well, but I'm going to try to give principle of charity. Um, when we say knowledge doesn't, origin, knowledge doesn't originate from us, but we determine what knowledge is by theory of knowledge. Right. That's the whole point of how matter of fact, this thing called the value problem that argues that knowledge is has no real yeah, axiological exactly. value over just having a true belief. There's something to be said for that. But we as humans want to differentiate. We like to categorize. We like to make things into well discrete categories and sets. So we say, OK, is there something a little bit more um, epistemically uh, certain 
uh, not necessarily certain to an absolute degree, but still a little bit more towards certainty other than belief. And we'll call that knowledge. And then the, uh, the past knowledge, we have certainty. And then if you want to go and get into like extreme Descartes certainty after that, but we like to categorize. But knowledge is not from us. Knowledge is what we say, okay, if you meet these conditions, because it's descriptive, then you, we, you can say you have knowledge. Yeah, to, to, have, to, to obtain knowledge, to have knowledge, doesn't make us the truth makers. Nope. Yeah, we we have propositions that are truth bearers, but we're not saying that if there's no God, that we're the truth makers. No, no, we discover what's true. We 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 learn knowledge. We don't we don't just you know we're we're not we're not we're not the grounding or standard or or uh, or standard of knowledge. Nope. We we discover knowledge using epistemic <laughs> means. All right, we got we got to wrap this up. <laughs> um, so anyways, I really want to thank you guys. I want to thank the live chat. Uh, if you guys got questions, please leave them in the comment section. Like I said, this is the third part of a three-part thing. Um, I will be doing um, Younger Creation stuff for a little while, as well as some philosophy. But uh, yeah, I've got, I got shows booked. I got two shows already booked and another one on this way to talk about biology and the theory of evolution with a PhD in biology to address some questions I was asked by a young YouTuber named Taylor on the Standing for Truth channel. Uh, Standing for Truth has been invited to come on any of these panels. He so far has not. He's, you know, said that he's going to, but he's more than welcome to. Um, I might even join him on a panel one of these days. But uh, a lot of things that Sending for Truth has been putting out um, has been, I think, having people on with some misinformation that this channel is going to correct a little bit. Uh, but anyways, Saiten, um, what do you want to leave us with? Yeah, well, I know that a lot of people are critical of uh, me going on these things and not sharing the gospel. But um, I would say even with the difficulties that I've been through is that... Uh, there's no other hope than putting your trust in Jesus Christ uh, to forgive your sins and the salvation for your sins. And, you know, that's what I pray for uh, you guys as well. And uh, Steve, you uh, specifically. And I, and I hope that uh, the Lord does indeed save you. And I hope that for the people watching here and people are free to contact me. And, um, you know, um, I, I'm no uh, theologian. I'm no counselor. I'm not allowed to counsel. So I get that. But I'll be happy to talk to anybody, answer the questions. And uh, I hope and pray that um, people repent and put their trust in Christ before it's too late. Yeah, I appreciate that, man. Like I said, I, you know, I, I, I appreciate the fact that you're willing to discuss your point of view and your positions. And, uh, you know, like I said, I, I happen to get along with you and like you. Um, we could have different, and, and it's so weird because people always say, oh, well, if you have different positions, you know, you can't get along with people. It's like, really? I thrive when people have different positions than I do. I never understood this narrative that I block people that disagree with me. I would have nobody on the show. <laughs> I, no I, think get along, I think we get along great in person as well. Oh, yeah. No, I'd have a drink with you anytime. Floyd, the Scotch person. Yeah. Uh, Floyd, I'm going to leave you for last. Um, Chris, you want to plug something real quick? Yeah, just real quick. That last question that we got um, asked actually kind of goes right in with what I was going to say. And uh, I'm really saying this more for just the audience and, and not necessarily for Sai. But Sai, if you wanted to add me on Facebook, we can definitely talk about this. So just real quick. Um, no, I believe that we can have knowledge without God in that um, I take uh, direct acquaintance to be or R what Russell proposed as direct acquaintance and was later developed by other philosophers such as Richard Fumerton. Um, to be the foundation for all knowledge. So real quick, in short, I'm going to quote uh, Richard Fumerton. Richard Fumerton says that uh, direct acquaintance is a real relation that obtains between consciousness and some thought, fact, or property. One has strong, non-inferentially justified belief that P, when one is directly acquainted with the thought that P, the fact that P, and the correspondence between the thought that P and the fact that P. And so um, now that takes care of our, our non-inferential beliefs. All right. Quit saying how they're, how, and, and how they're, <laughs> He's got to go pee. <laughs> one second, one second, one second. And then, so He's that takes cute. care of our, <laughs> our, our, so that takes care of our non-inferential beliefs. Okay. Now everything above the non-inferential level would be inferential. So you now have deductive inference or now you have inductive inference. And this is how we can gain things that, and that's, and this is also a level where it be, things become uncertain. Now, non-inferential beliefs, I can be certain about. Now, things above that, I cannot. So I can only infer them, right? Uh, so, and this is where you get into the justified true belief and that whole thing, correspondence theory of truth, which I take to be true. And uh, that's, and now notice throughout that whole thing, I did not need to posit a God. And uh, so instead of now throwing on that arbitrary assumption, uh, we ha now have this autonomous reasoning that, that we can appeal to as an unbeliever. I wish someone would have told me that whenever I was a believer trying to claw my way out of 
you know, my, admittedly, my situation totally was abusive. And way, so, not sorry, every... Real quick, so you, you could take off. I'm going to be ending this in like literally a minute. So all right. by all means, all right. take all right. off. Go, go, I, go take care of your bladder, man. Again. I know what it's like at our age. <laughs> all right. Thanks for <laughs> having me. Your bladder's the of a grape. <laughs> Later, man. <laughs> <laughs> all right. I didn't mean to interrupt you, but I know. Uh, dude, I know what it's like when you got to go pee. When you got to go pee, you got to go pee. I No, I get it. I get it. I totally get it. I just wanted to... I really wasn't saying that for him. I was really saying honest. it for for, yeah. for the audience. And then, you know, someone who actually makes it to the end of this video, I'm hoping that that'll kind of give them a little... Because no, unlike... I'm, because, Steve, I guess in one way we kind of disagree about this. I actually do get gleeful whenever Christians are, uh, leave the faith, just in the fact that uh, they're leaving what I consider to be false beliefs and are now entering into true, true or closer yeah, to no, true I get beliefs. That. Yeah, right? I get that. And so yeah, there, sure. there's that. So um, I would hope that that gives somebody who's stuck in this rut of presuppositionalism that's keeping them bound to a potentially not not all Christianity is abusive, but a potentially abusive situation. And so hopefully that can that can give them the strength to, you know, maybe clap back at some of their leaders uh, philosophically. I think it's fair. No, I think it's a good answer, man. All right. Um, Floyd, why don't you take us out? What do you got for us? And uh, by the way, as soon as you're done, I'm going to be um, exiting this, the, the meet because I got to go myself and ending the, the stream. So um, Real Anthology, you got a thing real quick before, before you go? I'm sorry. Yeah. Um, no, you're, you're good. Come on, Floyd, um, last. Yeah. Thank, thank you for having me on. Uh, I guess pleasure, I'll... Man plug uh real atheology a philosophy of religion podcast where we stuff. examine we examine questions in the philosophy of religion from non-theistic perspectives justin schieber is back we he has an episode out right now with dr michael himminson on the soul making <gasps> the odyssey awesome. and social yes. progress so be i sure. love justin is that, yeah is that go be check on, it out on, on, on um hicks soul building stuff Yes. Okay. So it's uh, basically Dr. Awesome. Uh, Hemingson argues that, like, look, if you accept the soul making the Odyssey, you basically should just oppose social progress. Yeah, that's awesome. No, I look forward to that. And by the way, like I said, I love your stuff. Um, I think you and Answers and Reason are highly, highly underrated and just should should have a million views although uh, answers the reason got most joke i love joe and dave well, they got a lot of the arguments from me um but you know what that I, i'm flattered by that um you know but they're amazing they're just uh, you know again they're not a, a, against going against the norm um i've had people tell me atheology isn't a real thing and i'm like are you kidding me it's, it just drives me nuts when i hear atheists tell me that atheology is not a real thing it's like it, i it, it makes me chuckle because i'm like oh I Hmm, I wonder what I'm doing. Yeah, then. as an atheist, what are you doing? <laughs> All right, guys. Um, Floyd, why don't you uh, give us what you've got? And by the way, if you haven't checked out Floyd's channel, he has a great series on this particular topic of why he's not a Christian uh, that I've put in the video descriptions. Uh, go ahead, Floyd. Yeah, I, I, I have to deal with Nocturio, uh, just like uh, you and Sai as well. So I'm, 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 I'm willing well, to admit I know that. Nocturio actually is at my age. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, uh, but yeah, I, I, just to plug my channel, I, I have a three-part series of my reasons why I'm not a Christian, and I also have a four-part four-part series right now where where I uh, dismantled this uh, presuppositionalism. Uh, my part two, um, I, I deal with a lot of size arguments, um, and also I hope uh, to I'm going to um, do a commentary on uh, a Greg Bonson debate where uh, Greg Bonson gives a ten-minute uh, like closing or opening. Uh, 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 dialogue or monologue on, you know, the problem of uh, the non-Christian worldview. So I plan to pick that apart. So if you want to learn how to counter size pre-sup arguments, I, I, I welcome you to, to uh, check out my, uh, my uh, presuppositionalist uh, um, sh uh, shows on my, uh, on my YouTube channel. Yeah, they're so. really good. Like I said, I've, I have, me and Floyd go back a long way. We were there when presuppositionalism hit, the internet kind of so to speak um and i know we had a lot of discussions him and i and ozzy and other people with presuppers um and we don't see presupp as anywhere near what it used to be it used to be when you go on our hangout some presupper would come in how do you account for knowledge how do, you know i just started running the prescup script and that's all it was and once you learn how to dismantle the prescup precept script like chris does floyd does we, they all know it's just it's just it's just super yeah, they kind of just they kind of just melt there yeah. i mean you know, oh, and one clarification, you can be certain about uh, successful deductive arguments because the conclusion must follow from the premises. Yeah, that, by the way, I will argue there, though, yeah, that's, I meant to clarify lo that. that's local certainty. You can, you, can, you can determine that 
that a conclusion must follow from the premises that is sound and valid, but that's a local necessity rather than. A I know I'm not. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. You're, pre, you're, pre, you're presupposing yeah. the the I, valid I nature of, of that, deduction, though. Um, well, that's that's true, but that's why it's locally determinant rather than globally. It's necessary. It's necessary that it follows from the premises locally, and this yeah, is the modal yeah, scope yeah. issue that um, I've ran into before. But people arguing certain things as logical necessities, but it's only local. Yeah, I, I was trying to uh, steer uh, Sai. Uh, to defend his Calvinism as well, and we didn't get into that well, much. Well, don't but worry. I, I, I got Matt Slick coming up for you one of these days. Uh, well, Matt Slick and I actually have gone at it a, a couple times. So we, I've gone up Matt, Matt too. I, 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 asked him, I asked him a question about, you know, why God foreordained stuff. And he says, what do you mean by foreordain? And I, and I say, he decrees things. Well, what do you mean by decree? And yeah, it just becomes the same game of semantics. I know. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I, say, I, I say to Matt, by what you mean by them. These yeah. are Calvinist terms. Let, let them let them do an, in, do an internal using their terminology. All right. right. Like I said, I'm going to end the hangout here, guys. Um, I want to thank all you gentlemen for coming on. Uh, yeah. Great respect for all of you. I appreciate your input on it. I want to thank my audience. If you want to, again, want to leave comments, by all means, leave comments. You can also leave donations through the comment section as well now. Um, and also, please review these videos as well. If you're a theist and you think that we made some errors, review them. I'm happy to address um, reviews and yet, I don't see them. And when I do see people arguing against me, they do so very, very basally and very, very fruit on the ground. Don't, 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 don't just pull this semantic type arguments or anything like that. Argue with some fervor, you know, say, hey, Steve, here's, you're, you're wrong. Let me show you and bring out some citations and, and cite, you know, scientific evidence. I love that because I'll address that. But if you just say I'm wrong by fiat because I'm Steve or that because God said so, you're not going to get much of a response from me. I don't have time for a lot of that stuff. I see it happening on various YouTube channels right now. Well, I'll get somebody who messes with me and it's basically is like, you're a mean poopy head evolutionist. Okay, whatever. That's just like saying I'm a globe head. I don't care. Um, give me science. Give me facts. Give me logic. Give me, give me at least a solid argument using rationalism. That's fine with me. But until I have that, you're probably not going to get a lot of my time. All right, guys, good night. Thank you for watching, and we'll see you later on the Non Sequitur Show.